Welcome everyone to our second virtual presentation. Let's begin the program. I'm going to ask David Hughes, Captain David Hughes, Regimental Historian of the Royal New Brunswick Regiment to introduce our speaker tonight. Thank you, Melinda. Well, it's my uh, pleasure to uh, have been chosen to be the one to introduce uh, Major Giroux. We're certainly very lucky to have him with us tonight. Major Jason Giroux, with a BA degree, Honours in History, specializing in 20th and 21st century military history. In September 1995, he initially enrolled in the Canadian Armed Forces as a private, completing his basic training at the Canadian Forces Leadership and Recruit School in St. jean sur Richelieu, Quebec. Upon his promotion to major in May 2014, he was posted to CTC's Tactics School. In that unit, he was both directing staff posted to the CTC's Tactics School and also a course officer for the Army Tactical Operations course. He was DS and course officer for the Infantry Dismounted Company Commanders course and DS for the Combat Team Commanders course. And as the officer commanding the Counter Improvised Explosives Device Cell, DS and course officer for the Tactical Exploiter course. Who was certainly busy over the tactics school and still is today. He is a passionate student of military history, collects military history books and paintings and prints, and enjoys creating military model dioramas. Please join me in welcoming Major Jason Giroux. Uh, David, thank you very much for that uh, for that introduction. Of course, Melinda Jarrett, who is uh, who has uh, been put so much effort and work into uh, organizing uh, tonight's event. And my very good friend, Mr. Charles Ferris, a fellow University of New Brunswick student. He and I were in the same uh, graduate seminar classes there. Charles has been the driving force uh, behind uh, tonight's lecture. So uh, Charles, uh, thank you very kindly um, for, uh, for organizing this and, and, uh, and uh, all of your energy and efforts for that. All right. I became a subject matter expert on this particular battle itself. Um, 20 years of urban operations research and, and training and, uh, and execution of exercises, training exercises in the tactics school in particular. And then my thesis uh, came from, uh, came from, and my enthusiasm for, for this particular thesis is, uh, is what brought us here tonight, really. So uh, let's go to uh, my next point, the Green Devils, the Germans. The Germans are, of course, the enemy here this evening, uh, called the Green Devils. Uh, because th it was the first, uh, it was the German first parachute division who the Canadians were facing, and they were apparently nicknamed the Green Devils by uh, Sir Winston Churchill himself. Um, before I get into a great discussion about the Germans, uh, I do have to talk about the strategic, operational, and tactical levels of operations just very briefly. And I'm going to try to make an effort, a concentrated effort tonight, not to get too uh, technical with my military jargon or any other doctrinal terms, uh, I'll try to explain it as best I can. Um, but let's talk about, there's three levels of operations when the when militaries conduct operations, there's three levels, strategic, operational, and tactical. So let's talk about the strategic uh, the strategic fight. So um, by by December 1943, when the Battle of Ortona occurs, Italy has been knocked out of the war. Uh, the Allies have landed in Sicily and have, have conquered Sicily throughout July and August of 1943, and in September, of 1943, they crossed to the toe of the Italian boot and they're working their way uh, up the uh, up the boot of Italy. And the Germans, the Germans who cannot allow um, any more uh, defeats like this, build a number of defensive lines. Um, for those of you who know Italy very well, of course, there's the Apennine Mountains in the center of the of the of the boot, and as a result of these high mountains, a lot of snow and melt and runoff creates and flows out to the Adriatic Sea and then in the Mediterranean Ocean and creates these very deep valleys. And these deep valleys are natural obstacles that are very tough to fight against. And so the Germans use these um, use these natural valleys as natural defensive obstacles and then they improve them with man-made obstacles and weapon systems. And you can see the number of defensive lines that are actually built throughout Italy to try to stop the Allies from advancing from advancing northwards. And it's the Gustav line that really concerns us here for this particular Battle of Ortona. All these other, uh, all these other defensive lines that you see are really built to delay 
the allies in advancing north so that the Gustav line can be uh, can be a, formid a formidable defensive line itself. There's another uh, line of the Gustav. Why did the Germans want to stop the allies at the Gustav line? Uh, that This is the reason why right there, the city of Rome, um, you cannot allow the Germans cannot allow the city of Rome to fall to the allies. That would be a huge psychological and physical defeat to the Germans. And it would be a huge psychological and physical victory for the allies to actually take the largest city of their former, uh, of their former enemy. Um, so this Gustav line is now being constructed and we, we now duck down, go down a level to the operational level of operations. The Gustav line is being constructed right across from just south of Rome all the way over to uh, what is thought to be north of Artona. So British Eighth Army intelligence uh, assumes, like uh, like they logically should, that uh, the Germans will um, uh, fight for Artona for maybe a couple of days as a delaying battle, and then they'll move back to the Ariely River. And that's where the Gustav line is. That is the main defensive Gustav line right there. And it was very logical for the British Eighth Army to think this because throughout the Sicily and the Italian campaigns, um, the Germans frequently would hold a town for maybe 24 to 48 hours. They would start taking losses and then they would use that as the delaying mechanism that would allow them to build the defensive uh, on those natural river valleys to the rear. They had been doing this throughout the Sicily and Italian campaign. And so... Uh, the Allies thought the exact same thing. Ah, they'll be in Ortona for a day or two. They're just delaying there. And then they'll pull back to the Ariely River, and that's where the Gustav line is, and that's where we're going to face them. Um, unfortunately, in this particular case, that is not true. The, uh, Ortona and the village of Villa Grande, which you see just to the southwest, are actually the eastern anchor points of the Gustav line. The Germans have every intent of holding Ortona for several days, if not weeks, in order to prevent the Canadians from breaking through. If the Canadians break through Ortona and the Gustav line, they can get up to the village, the town of Pescata, which is on the coast. And the, the challenge with, for the Germans for that is that Pescata has a road that co cuts through the Apennine Mountains and goes in through Rome's back door. So you cannot allow the Allies, the British Army, on, on the eastern side of Italy to get through the to get through the Gustav line, because once they get up to Pascara, all they have to do is turn southwest and drive southwest uh, through the mountains, and they're into Rome, and that is unacceptable. So the Germans actually make Ortona the eastern anchor of this Gustav line, and the Canadians have no idea. Uh, so let's talk. Let's get down to the tactical level now. The tactical level of planning. Um, the Germans and their defense plan in Ortona. That's the best German accent I can do, by the way. I can't do anything better than that. So uh, there's a port in Ortona. It's a very small port. Um, the, the Allies don't want to bomb uh, Ortona itself because they're worried about the port. They need ports for logistical reasons. Remember, logistics is very important in, um, in any kind of military operation. You need to get the bullets, the beans, and the water up to the front lines. And uh, in the Second World War, naval logistics was so important in, in order to do that. And so the Germans, very rightly, uh, in their part of their defense, they destroy the port facilities, unfortunately, un un unbeknownst to the Allies. Um, at, what the Germans want to do is they want to conduct what in urban operations doctrine is called a perimeter force battle. They want the Canadians to know, yeah, we're right here. We're at the south end of the town. Come on in. We're going to entice the Canadians in to into the, into the town itself. And then we're going to suck the Canadians into a disruption force battle where we'll be able to do a trit We'll be able to kill some of the Canadians and we're going to suck them into the middle of the town. This is the disruption force battle in urban operations doctrine. And then once we get to the middle of the town, this is where our main defensive areas are at the piazza, the piazza, uh, the, the squares, the town squares that are throughout the town itself. So once we get the Canadians, once we've sucked them into the town, we're going to destroy them. Um, using the, the squares as our killing zones. And this is where we're going to stop the Canadians. Um, within, within so the Germans launch, they have the second battalion of the third parachute regiment within Ortona. And then the rest of the first Canadian, uh, first parachute division is just west of Ortona, uh, just west of Ortona itself. Um, what are some of the, some of the, there's the, there's the squares, the piazza, uh, the piazza um, in Italian terms there. 
Um, there's the squares themselves, and I'll, I'll be going into those in greater detail later on. But what else do the Germans do? They have engineers in Ortona for several months, um, since September 1943, December 1943. They have engineers conducting a number of tasks. They are destroying buildings. Um, they are rubbling buildings to fall into the secondary streets of Ortona itself. They want to do this because, remember, they're trying to suck the Canadians up the main road and up into the piazzas. They don't want the Canadians to flank by going down the secondary road. So they're destroying all dozens and dozens of buildings to, so that the buildings fall into the streets and create all these piles of rubble. And then what they do is they put booby traps and landmines into the rubble itself. And then they cover those, those big obstacles with machine guns that are up on the windows of, uh, of the building so that the Canadians can't use these secondary streets. It'll be too hard for the tanks and the anti-tank guns and the engineers to get over these piles of rubble, for the infantry to get over these piles of rubble. They put booby traps everywhere on doors and windows um, within the rubble piles themselves. They put booby traps on toilet chains and within toilets because of the Canadians thinking, oh, who have never had, you know, they're fighting the Canadian soldiers who have been fighting throughout the countryside don't have access to plumbing facilities. So they're going to, so the Germans are going to put um, booby traps on toilets so that when the Canadians sit down to use the facilities, they'll be able to kill some Canadians that way. And they're going to create mouse holes. They're going to create little holes throughout the buildings to avoid walking on the streets so they can move from house to house without exposing themselves. So these are the, the number of things that the Germans are doing for several weeks and months as they're preparing. Um, they put machine guns and, and riflemen on the ground floors of buildings. And then on the second and third and fourth floors of buildings, there's machine gun nests with more riflemen and uh, grenadiers to protect those machine guns and some snipers and marksmen on the top floors and maybe the rooftops of the buildings themselves surrounding the piazzas, uh, the piazza there. Uh, so, um, so that, and then what they also have is anti-tank weapons. This is a German paratrooper division. So they don't have tanks, but they have any tank guns. And so they're going to use their anti-tank guns as well to try to destroy any Canadian tanks that, uh, that come into the town of Ortona itself. Just to give you an idea of the rubbling, Charles Comfort, uh, Captain Charles, or Major, I should say, Major Charles Comfort, he's a captain at the time. Uh, Charles Comfort was able to get into the town of Ortona on the third or the fourth day of the battle. And he has a number of absolutely wonderful paintings um, that he created from this particular battle. And you can see uh, just an example of a secondary street, very narrow. Uh, some of these secondary streets, not even ox cart width. And you can see the Canadian soldiers behind the green door at the bottom left of the corner, just to give you an idea of how narrow the streets are in the rubbling program that the Germans did throughout the entire town, making it so difficult to be able to advance down those streets with tanks, artillery, engineers, and infantry soldiers. Um, and again, all these rubble piles being liberally sewn with booby traps and, and uh, improvised explosive devices and landmines, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the German preparation of the town. And again, it's the Eastern anchor of the Gustav line. So they spend several months um, preparing the, the, the town's defenses. Let's go to the Red Patch Devils, the Canadians now. Uh, the Red Patch Devils, the first Canadian infantry division, um, which is the most experienced combat division the Canadians have so far in the Second World War. It has fought throughout Sicily. It has fought throughout the Southern Italy. It has been taken out of the battle for a few weeks where it does some minor actions, but then it's thrown into the fight just the southwest of Ortona. Uh, it's called, they're called the Red Patch Devils because in Sicily, um, as they were fighting around Ajira, um, the uh, German prisoner of war says, we don't understand you, you Red Patch Devils because of course the first Canadian division wears a red rectangular patch on, on both of their shoulders. And the, the German prisoner of war says, we don't understand you Red Patch soldiers. Um, whenever we throw indirect fire and mortar and artillery down, all these other soldiers just lay down on the ground and take it. But the Red Patch Devils, they get up and they run through the artillery fire and they attack our positions. You guys, these Red Patch Devils are just incredible. And so the nickname stuck. And so uh, there's a delicious irony, a delicious irony that the Green Devils, as the Germans were now facing the Red Patch Devils, the Canadians in Ortona, in this little urban hell, uh, if I can uh, be so metaphors. So um, the 1st Canadian Infantry Division thrown in to the fight once again, just southwest of Ortona, where it fights in the Moro River and the Gully, just to set the strategic and operational scene. And um, the 1st Canadian Infantry Division has as its core 
three infantry brigades, the 1st Canadian Infantry Brigade, the 2nd Canadian Infantry Brigade, and the 3rd Canadian Infantry Brigade. Um, it's commanded by Major General Christopher Vokes, and uh, Vokes throws 1st Canadian Infantry Brigade and 3rd Canadian Infantry Brigade, one battalion at a time, into the Moral River fight and the, the, the Moral River fight in the gully and the fight for the gully. And I won't go into great detail with that, but the 1st and the 3rd Brigade, by the time they finish those two fights, are exhausted and very much depleted in manpower. And they're now, the division is now approaching Ortona. So uh, General Vokes turns to the second brigade commander, Brigadier General Bertram Hoffmeister and says, Hoffy, um, you're gonna send the second Canadian Infantry Brigade into Ortona. You don't have any worries though. The Germans are not gonna fight a spirited defense. Once again, the Ariely River is where the Gustav line is. You'll only have to face the Germans for 24 to 48 hours. And then they'll, they'll they'll withdraw back to the area of the river and you've got the town. That's Bert Hoffmeister, Hoffy, uh, that's up at the top. He's a brigadier at the time of this particular battle. He was a company commander and the commanding officer of the Seaforth Highlanders of Canada uh, from Vancouver, BC. There he is on the left when he was with the C as the commanding officer of the Seaforth on the right, when eventually later on in the war, he gets promoted to major general and becomes the fifth Canadian armored division commander. Uh, that's him on the right there. The second Canadian infantry brigade has at its core three battalions of infantry from three different regiments. You have the Loyal Edmonton Regiment, the Loyal Eddies from Edmonton, Alberta, obviously. You have the Seaforths, uh, Bert, Bert Hoffmeister's regiment from, uh, from Vancouver, BC. And you have Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry, which hails from Western Canada. Uh, those are the three main infantry battalions that are gonna be involved in this fight, the Loyal Eddies and the Seaforths in particular. And then you have some other units from the 1st Canadian Infantry Division that are supporting 2nd Canadian Infantry Brigade within this fight, you have an armored regiment, the 12th Canadian Armored Regiment, Three Rivers from uh, Three Rivers, Quebec, Trois-Rivières, -Rivier, Quebec. You have 4th Field Company from the Royal Canadian Engineers. And from New Brunswick, you have the 90th Anti-Tank Battery of the Royal Canadian Artillery, um, in particular, K, L, and J troops um, from the 90th Anti-Tank Battery itself. And, right, so those are basically the units that are going to be involved in this particular fight uh, within Ortona. Let's talk about the geographic factors. Uh, north uh, is at the top of the photo, as you see there. Uh, Ortona itself, Ortona is split into Old Town and New Town. The Old Town is obviously the older part of the town, and many of the houses there stand three to four east three to four stories high and are shoulder to shoulder. You literally can't squeak your, your body between the houses. They are literally uh, right up, but just up against, uh, uh, against each other throughout uh, the entirety, uh, throughout the majority of Old Town, I should say. And then New Town um, has, its, has larger buildings, which are separated and you can actually get tanks and personnel uh, in between them. Uh, so that's the difference between Old Town and New Town. Uh, when it comes to the, the town itself. Here's a great shot of it. Uh, this is a very modern shot of Ortona, but you can see in the north end of the town how all the, how all the, all the buildings are very closely packed together. And in Newtown, it's, the buildings are, are, are a little further apart um, from each other and a bit larger as well. So that, that means it's gonna take time, a longer time to clear those of any enemy if they're, in, if they're inside. Steep contours, ravines and cliffs. Ortona is built on a plateau. It's built on a plateau and of course, Many towns in Sicily and Italy are. Um, it's both a, uh, there's both social, economic, agricultural, and military reasons why a lot of the towns and cities are built on plateaus. Uh, for a military reason, it makes the town easier to defend because your enemy now has to fight uphill. For agricultural reasons, you can put your farms down in the valley where all the rain will wash down and, and water your crops. Um, and you can live up top where you know you're not going to be flooded or anything of the such. Um, so there's a number of reasons why the towns and cities in Italy are on these plateaus and Ortona is no different. There's a very steep uh, ravine off to the west side. It's about 50 to 75 meters deep. And then there's a very steep cliff about 50 to 75 meters on average that goes along the east side of the town. And then finally at the north, the Fosso Chivaco, which is uh, Chivaco, I should say, which is a large ditch. It's a very sizable ditch. Uh, I would consider it more of a valley. Um, but what's the military reasoning behind this? Well, now this means that you can't flank Ortona. The, uh, you've had the steep cliff on the east side and the steep ravine on the west side. So you can't send forces to try to flank the Germans on the side. You have to attack this town from the south. And that means that this is a defender's dream. 
um, in offensive operations, you're always trying to flank the enemy to try to get in behind them uh, because their weapons are pointed towards you. So try to get around the weapons so you're not, you don't take casualties. Um, but Ortona does not allow for that. The Canadians have to attack it from the south because of the steep ground on either side. Um, just to picture that again, a very modern photo of Ortona, satellite photo of Ortona. You can see the top, the arrows at the, at the top uh, left to right, those reflect the con the um, the contour uh, diagram that's on the left side of the diagram itself, with the little X on the arrow also on the diagram on the left. This shows how steep the ravine, the fossil, and the cliffs are. Uh, you can see the scale on the on on there as well, and, and this is throughout the entirety of the town. Um, as you move north to south, these these ravine and cliffs uh, just remain so remarkably high that it's absolutely impossible to flank the town itself. And that's a major factor in this battle. Um, here's a great view. The wonderful thing about Ortona is there was a Canadian Army Photography and Film Unit that uh, uh, documented this battle uh, quite well. And so you can see there are the Seaforths on the left advancing with Ortona well off in the distance. And then on the right, they've gotten themselves a little closer and you can see Ortona, but you can see how it rests on that plateau. And there's those steep, the steep cliff and then the Adriatic sea just uh, just to the east as well which also prevents any kind of flanking movement so the canadians have no choice but to attack from the south in particular the adriatic sea as i mentioned uh very sizable it covers the east and up to the north side of the town so uh quite impossible to flank the town also because of that very reason and then you have the main streets uh themselves uh you see at the bottom there, I'll start from south to north, the course will be on street, which is Highway 16. It's Highway 16 outside of the city. And then when it gets into the town, it's renamed the Corso Bianchi. And then it becomes the Corso Vittorio Emanuele. And then it becomes the Via Tripoli. And then it, re re then it renames Highway 16 again. This highway is the division's axis of advance. It is how 1st Canadian Infantry Division is, is advancing. And it's also its main logistical supply route. So one of the reasons why the Canadians are told they have to go in Ortona is because they need to secure the highway that allows for the bullets, the beans and the water to be moved up to the front lines. And you can see there, I've, what I've put is the, the streets that are outlined in red will eventually be the roads that the Loyal Edmonton Regiment fights on. The streets outlined in, in yellow are, this, are the streets and roads that the Seaforth Highlanders of Canada will fight on. Once again, with the rubbling program, it was impossible for the Canadians to move any kind of forces up those secondary streets. Um, and again, the German intent is leave those main roads open and suck the Canadians in so we can destroy them when they get to the various piazza that are, uh, that are throughout the town. And there's a, once again, the piazza, at the very north, the Piazza San Tomaso, uh, the Piazza Plebiscita uh, in the center of the Piazza Municipale on the east and the Piazza San Francesco on the west. These are the main, this is the main defensive area of the Germans. This is where the Germans are going to definitely stop the Canadians and destroy them. And then you have another Piazza of the South, the Piazza Vittoria. And uh, I'll, I'll talk about why Piazza San Francesco is renamed Dead Horse Square uh, later on as I talk about the battle itself. Some prominent buildings. I'll go from north to south in this particular case, the Castello. There is an old castle at the north end of the town. It's very much in ruins. Um, there's a railway tunnel that's been dug underneath of it, so the castle does not feature prominently in this particular battle. Um, uh, three absolutely stunning and beautiful cathedrals within Ortona at the very north, the most, one of the most revered ones, uh, the Cathedrale Santa Maso, uh, which houses the tomb of St. Thomas, uh, who is very much revered uh, in Ortona itself. You have the town hall. Uh, the school, the hospital, and the, and another cathedral in Piazza San Francesco. And then uh, down to the southeast, another revered church within the town, the Church of Santa Maria de Constantinopoli. And then there's a pensione uh, just to the southwest, which uh, I'll tell you why it becomes Johnson's house uh, when I talk about the battle itself. But all these buildings are very large. And when it comes to urban operations, it takes a long time for... Uh, friendly forces to get into these buildings and clear them of enemy forces. Um, as an example, uh, the, uh, a bungalow, just a bungalow, will probably take about 30 to 35 soldiers. It'll probably take them about 45 to 60 minutes to kill all of the enemy and clear that uh, house uh, of the enemy itself. Uh, that's that's the average. Uh, uh, that's the average time it will take 
a platoon of about 30, 35 soldiers to do that. So the larger the building, the more time it's going to take and the more resources you need to commit to killing the enemy within those buildings. So these large buildings will take hours upon hours to clear um, in some cases because they're so large and there's so many uh, German soldiers inside of them, the Canadians have to fight for many hours just to, to destroy the Germans inside these buildings. So that's why it's important to name these particular buildings. And finally, there's a railway and a railway tunnel that surrounds the town. The tunnel becomes very important because the Germans will use the tunnel as an area of rest and, and reserve. Um, while they commit their forces to the fight, they can have the remainder of their forces safely ensconced inside the tunnel itself so if the Canadians are dropping artillery and mortar fire, um, the Germans will be safe and safe uh, where they can get some good sleepy time, where they can rest and relax and, and have a good meal and without fear of being hit by Canadian artillery fire. Um, the Canadians will not have that luck. The Canadians have to fight for every building. And then at nighttime, they have to bed down in, this, in the destroyed buildings um, that they've just fought for. Um, because uh, they don't have a tunnel. Um, they don't have a tunnel like the Germans do. So the Germans will use that tunnel very much to their advantage uh, throughout this particular fight. All right, they are to Once again, I mentioned before how civilians are so critical in the urban fight. You will find throughout military history that whenever you're talking about any type of urban operation, civilians are in the battle space. Again, in the rural countryside, the tanks and the armored fighting vehicles and the soldiers will drive by, hopefully drive by the civilian houses and the, and the and those types of areas and get it and fight the battle down the way. Um, and that's what happens when you're fighting in a rural countryside. And if you're lucky, that's what happens to you if you're living in the countryside. But in the urban battle space, civilians will not vacate. Can you imagine if somebody came up to your house right now? So let's say I came up to your house right now and I knocked on your door. I said, hi, uh, my name is Major Jason Giroux. Listen, we're going to be fighting a battle here. We're going to be fighting a battle in your town. Uh, you get out. You have to leave. Uh, take whatever possessions you want, but uh, we're fighting this, uh, we're starting this tomorrow, so get out of your house, please. Um, you would all agree that our, house, our houses or our apartments or wherever we live, those are the safety nests. Um, those, though our houses and where we live, these are the thing. this place is our safe area away from the dangers of the outside world. Um, that's why we feel so violated when burglars or people break into our houses, because these are supposed to be safe havens, safe areas. And um, when you are extremely poor or when you don't have a lot of money and you only have your house and that is it, the place that you live, you don't want to leave it because, well, what if somebody breaks into my place and steals things? What if there's looting or thievery or burglary? Um, you don't want to leave your house. Um, but in, so uh, the problem with urban areas, of course, is that there are, there are hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of houses and apartment buildings and if somebody comes up to you and says, you have to leave, you're reluctant to do so because this is supposed to be your safe haven and all of your personal possessions are here. Um, so in the urban area, you, you will find that a majority of civilians will not want to leave. And so now you have to have a cunning plan to get them out so that they don't become killed or wounded. Um, they don't become collateral damage as a result of the fight. Um, Ortona itself has a population of about 10,000 people in 1943. Um, even the Germans recognize that they can't have civilians in the battle space, but for ulterior motives, they don't, they're worried that the Ortonesi, uh, Ortona civilians, will act as spies and tell the Allies where the Germans are. So the Germans forcibly evict um, about 90% of the Ortonesi from the town. Um, they conscript all of the fighting age males into slave labor to help them build defenses in the town or even, or even transport them north of the uh, north into the northern Italy to keep prepare, to help prepare the German defensive lines that are north in the northern part of the country. And then they post, post, they post signs all over the town. If you are found within the town, you will be considered a spy and you will be shot. Even then, even then, about a thousand or, of Ortona civilians risk staying within the town because once again, they have nowhere to go or they don't want to leave their houses or their apartments because this is all they've got for their personal possessions. And so there's about a thousand civilians that will stay in the town itself. And they just hope they're gonna hide in their basements and they're just going to hope that the battle and the violent storm that's about to do a descend on them will pass them by. Uh, unfortunately, um, when I get to the uh, post-battle events, um, this is most unfortunate for a lot of the 
of the uh, of the civilians. Um, before the battle starts, the Germans, as part of their rubble program, remember they're destroying um, dozens and dozens of buildings and houses, and sometimes unknowingly and sometimes very knowingly, they decide to destroy these houses with Italian civilians still inside of them. And there are dozens of families that are killed even before the Canadians enter the town because the Germans collapse buildings on top of men, women, and children, and it's absolutely horrific. But this is the price you pay when civilians um, stay in the urban battlefield, and it's, it's quite unfortunate. So I'll, I'll, I'll have to hit the highlights of the battle, if you don't mind. Uh, so here we go. Remember, I was, trying to, I was trying to organize the chaos, right? So I've, what I've come up with in my thesis and what you see here in front of you is you're going to see a day-by-day -day progression of this particular fight uh, inter interspersed with uh, talking points. A friendly reminder, a friendly reminder, folks. Remember, the Canadians think that the, Ger the Germans are only going to be in Ortona for 24 to 48 hours, and then they're going to withdraw, go back to the Ariely River, and that's where their main defensive line is. So, Brig uh, Brigadier uh, Bertram Hoffmeister, Hoffy, the second brigade commander, he has an, an orders group and he says, right, well, if the Germans are only going to be there for 24 to 48 hours, I need to take Highway 16, the main road through the town. Geez, I only need to commit really a battalion to this. So he says to the Loyal Edmonton Regiment, he goes to C Lieutenant Colonel Jim Jefferson of the Loyal Eddies, says, Jim, just take your battalion, go up the main street, pop the Germans in the nose, make them bleed. And then they're going to withdraw, and then you're good to go. Yes, sir. He uh, Hoffy turns to Lieutenant Colonel Sid Thompson of the C4th Highlanders, and he says, Sid, I just want you to take your battalion out on the right side. You'll be the right flank protection for the brigade. And then he turns to the Princess Patricia's Canadian Line Infantry, the Patricia's, and he says, Patricia's, you're just going to be on the left flank. You're going to protect the left flank um, of the brigade as the loyal ladies go up and, and pop the Germans in the nose. That's all we need to do. That's all we need to do. So on the, on the 20th of December, the, uh, the Loyal Eddies and the Seaforths begin advancing towards Ortona, south of the city at 12 o'clock. Um, an artillery barrage falls down, a creeping barrage falls down in front of the infantry, the engineer and the uh, armored soldiers and the armored tanks as they're going along. The Loyal Edmonton Regiment uh, advancing up Highway 16 with uh, Bravo, a Bravo company of about a hundred soldiers. When I say about a company of soldiers, that's about a hundred or so soldiers. So Bravo company on the left side of the highway, a Delta company on the right side of the highway. You have a troop of tanks. So when I say a troop of tanks, that's four tanks in total in a troop. Uh, so four tanks from the three rivers regiment advancing up with the engineers. And as they're advancing up the road, um, one of the tanks actually runs over 200 pounds of TNT, blows the tank up. It's actually the uh, troop commander, Lieutenant Melvin, and his tank actually gets blown 50 feet into the air, turns over upside down and lands, and it kills Lieutenant Melvin and, all, and, and his crew inside the tank. The other tanks get off the road, and they get mired down in a minefield. It turns out that that, that anti-tank obstacle of uh, the 200 pounds of TNT deliberately put there so that the other tanks will move off the road and into a, a hidden minefield where they get their tracks blown off. And then there's some rapid machine gun and small arms fire from Germans in trenches um, just north of the, um, of the, uh, of the loyal ladies themselves. So now the loyal ladies are into this fight just south of the town. Off to the east, the Seaforth Highland Highlanders are advancing. Uh, Delta Company, again, about 100 soldiers on the left. Charlie Company, another 100 soldiers on the right. Delta Company trying to move to a piece of high ground. So they can fire Charlie Company onto their objective. But as Charlie Company is moving up to their high ground there, there's a number of machine gun nests on the high ground just south of Ortona. And so the, so the Seaforths have a bit of a fight there to advance to and oh, to get over the precipice and, and destroy these German trenches. Um, they were supposed to move up to the Church of Santa Maria de Constantinopoli, but they fall about 300 meters short by the time uh, the end of the day occurs and there you see the photo of some loyal eddies on the outskirts of of Edmund, of, uh, of uh, Ortona uh, uh, engaged in combat with the Germans there so at uh, so that's the 20th of December and the Canadians at this point are like all right if the Germans are supposed to be only delaying us for 20 44 hours they're already putting up a pretty good fight so I wonder what's going on here all right well uh, Hoffy says, right, okay, that was kind of unexpected, but let's keep driving into the town. Loyal Eddies, you still got to get into the town and get the highway. 
And see for us tomorrow, the 21st, you got to get up to Santa Maria de Constantinople and take that church. Patricia's, you're still good off on the left flank. Uh, good to go. First of December, a huge explosion rocks the air at 0700 hours in the morning. The, the Germans, the Germans have destroyed the Cathedrale San Tommaso up at the north end of the town. They have completely destroyed it. On this most holy day, it's the 21st of December. It is the feast of San Tommaso. This is a this the 21st of December is a day that is revered by the Ortonesi because they celebrate. They have a big social event on this particular day uh, up at the cathedral because this is where Saint Thomas is entombed. This is uh, this is a revered church and and uh, and this is now the Germans on this most holy day have destroyed the cathedral at the north end of the town to add to the rubble. Um, that is in the Piazza San Tommaso itself. Absolutely horrifying. And, and just to give you an idea, of, to just look at the size of this cathedral. It's very sizable. And you see Charles Comfort, once again, Charles Comfort and his wonderful paintings on the left and a photograph, an actual photograph taken. And you can see the size of this cathedral, Charles Comfort and the photo. You can see the, the, the people and Charles Comfort's photo are very are small and black. And on the right, you can see the Canadian soldiers just off to the left side of the photo. Um, the Germans, it's like a big cleaver, to quote Mark Zuki, a big cleaver has come down and just chopped the cathedral in half um, to add to this rubbling, uh, to add to this rubbling program, which is absolutely horrific itself. Um, so um, the Loyal Eddies now are told by Hoffie, let's get into the town. Uh, Delta Company, um, that is on the left side of the road. You have Bravo Company on the right side of the road. And as they're Approach Bravo Company of the Loyal Eddies does quite well. It's able to fight up and get into the southern edges of the town. Delta Company, uh, Major Jim Stone is the is the company commander. He is trying to get Delta Company up and into the edge of the town, but he does two attacks. And right at the bottom of the Pensioni, the Germans have a number of trenches, and they're well entrenched at the bottom of the Pensioni. And they're just cutting down Jim Stone's Canadians from the Loyal Eddies. He tries two attacks across the open field and uh, he loses. He starts off with a company of about 100 soldiers. And by the time of the second attack, he's down to about 30 soldiers, um, a platoon of 30 soldiers. Um, he gets on the radio and he says to Colonel Jim Jefferson, sir, I can't get into uh, Ortona. I need to move over to Bravo Company's side and get into the tone. But Jim Jefferson's like, no, nope, sorry, Jim. Um, I need the road. We need to clear the road. That's our main task, so you've got to get in there. And, and Jim Stone's not happy about this, and he's preparing to do a third suicidal charge up into the south end of the town when one of his command, when one of his platoon commanders, one of his subordinates, Jim Duggan or J James Dugan, says, "Hey, sir, I got an idea. There's a trench just off to the side. Maybe I can take some guys and we can sneak in behind the Germans there and get into that pensione, get into that large building, and we can shoot him from behind." And so, so Jim Stone says, "James, off you go." So Jim, Jim, James takes some soldiers. They're able to sneak in behind and into the town. They get into the pensione and they, they're up, they get up to the second floor and they look out and they can see the Germans in the trenches in front of the building and they destroy, they, they shoot down into the German trenches. Good to go. And Delta company now is able to advance and get into the, uh, the, the south end of the town. And at this point, um, at this point, Jim Jefferson, the commanding officer, Colonel Jim Jefferson, the commanding officer of the Loyal Eddies, doesn't know where his lead troops are. So he sends up his scout platoon commander, Lieutenant Alan Johnson, to find out where D and B companies are. And he run, and Alan Johnson runs into Jim Stone. And Jim Stone's like, I've got a bunch of prisoners here. Uh, they're, they're in the Pensione. And he calls the Pensione Johnson's house. Uh, he says to Alan Johnson, take these prisoners back. They're in Johnson's house over there. And so he's at, so Alan Johnson takes these prisoners back, and that's why the Pensione becomes called uh, Johnson's House. Um, the Seaforths are over on the right side of the town, and uh, remember they're 300 meters short uh, short of the church, and so now they have to fight their way up to the church, and they get into the, they they fight their way up to the church, get into the church, and now they have to spend a couple of hours. The Santa Maria de Constantinople, a very large building, and the, the Seaforths fight in the church and they're able to, after several hours of fighting, clear uh, the church itself. Now the Loyal Eddies and the Seaforths are safely ensconced in the south end of the town and they're looking up the streets and they're like, geez, there's a lot of rubble piles there. How in the heck are we going to get over these rubble piles? Well, we got the engineers with us. The engineers try to approach the rubble piles. They see all the landmines, the booby traps, but every time they go up to these rubble piles, the Germans with their machine guns 
that are in second and third floor story windows uh, start shooting at the at the engineers. And it's at this point, the tanks from the Three Rivers Regiment and the uh, the anti-tank guns from the Royal Canadian Artillery, uh, the six pounder anti-tank guns are brought up. Uh, Major Tiger Welsh is the is the officer commanding the 90th anti-tank batteries. He knows the Germans don't have tanks, but he's got these wonderful six pounder and 17 pounder anti-tank guns. Why have these guns just be left out of the battle? Um, if the Germans are being so stubborn, why not bring the anti-tank guns up and we can destroy, not only destroy the German position, but we can fire at the rubble piles, destroy the landmines, destroy the booby traps and lower the, lower the rubble piles so the tanks and the infantry and the engineers can actually get over these things. So the, so as you can see in those photos there, you got some, uh, some, some Canadian troops wheeling up a six pounder anti-tank gun so they can use them against German positions and rubble piles. And that was very appreciated by the infantry and the engineers. And so uh, they roll these six pounder guns up. They just, they lower the rubble piles so the tanks can fire over the rubbles because these rubble piles are like 12 to 15 feet high. And they're fairly, fairly substantial. They're fairly substantial. So this is what happens on the morning of the 21st of, of December and on, on the afternoon and the evening um, at the afternoon, and the evening on the Seaforth side, on the Eastern side, um, Sid Thompson, the commanding officer, Colonel Sid Thompson brings the Seaforths, the rest of the battalion, up to the Church of Santa Maria de Constantinople, and he puts them inside the church safe and sound. And he pushes Charlie Company about a few hundred meters just southwest, northwest of the of the church, just to protect the battalion, just in case the Germans try to counterattack or anything and such. Meanwhile, on the west side, the Loyal Edmonton Regiment, Colonel Jefferson says, "You know what, troops, we got to keep going. We got to get up this highway now." And so he puts he puts uh, a company, he puts Delta Company on the left side of the road, Bravo Company. On and he has the true. He has the engineers in support, and he has a troop of tanks, four tanks, from the Three Rivers Regiment in support. And what he's going to do is, in urban operations doctrine, he's going to conduct a thrust. And in thrusting, it means he, they're going to go up the street, but they're going to clear every building as they go up the street. And this way, it's a slow, methodical process, but at least they're clearing the buildings of enemy soldiers. And so this way they know they're safe. They can, they can bring more soldiers up without having to worry about being shot at from the rooftops or anything of the such. Um, and what happens also is that Hofmeister, the brigade commander says, you know what, Jim, uh, uh, I'm gonna give you an extra company of Seaforths to protect your left flank. So uh, Hoffie turns to Sid Thompson and goes, Sid, I want you to give a company of about hundred soldiers to Jim Jefferson over the Loyal Eddies so they can go up the left side of the road to protect the loyal ladies from being flanked on the left side. And so that's what happens there. So now for the rest of the afternoon, the evening, the Canadians um, are slowly working their way up the Corso Bianchi, uh, up to uh, up to the, uh, the after the and, and as I mentioned, more resources because of how stubborn the Germans appear to be, um, Hofmeister is throwing more resources into this fight. It's not just the loyal ladies anymore. Now he's got more tanks, he's got more engineers, he's committed a company from the Seaforth um, as they do this slow fight up to the Piazza Vittoria. Once again, thanks to the Canadian Army Film and Photography Unit that was in Ortona, you can see some loyal Edmontons uh, working their way up a side street on that top photo. And what you can see in the bottom left photo, that's the same street. You can see the building, how the building in the background matches, but you can see the level of destruction that's occurred a couple days later as these German prisoners, these German paratrooper prisoners of war are taken back to uh, the rear lines um, um, while the Canadians continue to fight this battle. 22nd of December then, uh, we have the, um, we have to get through the Piazza, the Canadians have to get through the Piazza Vittoria. Um, they're at the south end of the Piazza. And so on the morning of the 22nd, uh, they have to get through the uh, Piazza Vittoria itself. Um, just to the southeast, uh, the Seaforths, remember the battalion is safely inside the church of Santa Maria de Constantinople. Um, but around 10.30 in the morning, they start getting artillery and mortar shells falling on the roof of the church. And one of those artillery rounds lands on a couple of vehicles beside the church. The intelligence officer's Jeep and uh, an ammunition truck are blown to pieces. And in fact, um, Major Sid Thompson, or I'm sorry, Sid Thompson, the commanding officer of the Seaforth, daringly jumps into his own Jeep and drives it um, away from the burning of vehicles so that his Jeep doesn't blow up. And then uh, Sid Thompson realizes it's getting kind of silly here. Um, we're taking now, there's all kinds of artillery and mortar rounds falling on the roof of the church. I've got my troops inside the church. Um, the roof seems to be doing a good job, but this, this is making me nervous. So in the afternoon, 
He, he pushes Charlie Company up a little further to the northwest, and they're supported by a troop of tanks. And they see, they actually see the German mortar round, the German mortar team that's firing the mortars at the church. And so around 1500 hours at 3 p.m., they're able to uh, fire, the tank is able to fire that German mortar team to safely uh, uh, brisk them away um, from firing any more rounds on the sea force. Meanwhile, the Loyal Eddies are fighting within the Piazza Vittoria itself with, of course, the Three Rivers Regiment in support. The Three Rivers um, have bring four tanks up to the Piazza Vittoria. And you can imagine the four tanks now sitting in the Piazza Vittoria just blasting away at any of the German positions they see around the Piazza itself. Um, and as well, the, the Loyal Eddies have brought up their six pounder anti tank guns. The Royal Canadian Artillery has brought up their six pounder anti tank guns, and they're just blasting away at all the German positions around the Piazza itself. This very large building that you see um, in all these photos is actually still exists. It's still in Ortona itself. And if you go to Ortona, you will see this building on the west side of uh, Piazza, uh, the same. Uh, the Loyal Eddies and the Three Rivers, the engineers and the anti tank guns from the artillery clear the piazza. Um, and uh, they begin now uh, wanting to move past the piazza itself. You can see the tanks, Three Rivers Regiment tanks supporting, um, uh, looking down range. Um, the, the tank on the right is looking north up the course of Vittorio Emanuele. And the tank off to the left side of the photo, looking down west, looking down the Via Rapino. It was not without sacrifice, Sergeant Johnny Marchand of Three Rivers Regiment, as he was sticking his body outside the top of the tank. He was shot by a German sniper. And once again, the photography film unit of the Canadian Army there to photograph all of this as it's going on. And you can see the photos of uh, Johnny Marchand being tended to there in those three photos in the, in the, in, in the bottom of the uh, itself. All right. So... Um, Colonel Jim Jefferson tells the loyal ladies, right, you got to carry on. You, we've cleared the Piazza Vittoria. Up you go, up the Corso Vittorio Emanuele. This photo here is of the Corso Vittorio Emanuele. You can see now we're into, we're, we're into Old Town, um, where all the houses are very much shoulder to shoulder. They're two, three, four stories high. And you can understand that you, you have to stay on the streets. You, in order to move from house to house, you have to move down the streets in order to do it. And then, of course, the Canadians are going in through the bottom doors, the doors on the ground floor, and then fighting up. Uh, and they're fighting the Germans upwards. And that, of course, when you're fighting battles upwards, that's always tough because gravity always works for the defenders. <clears throat> so, uh, Jim, uh, correction, Big Jim Stone, the, the company commander of Delta Company of the Loyal Eddies, he's thinking, geez, we've been doing this. We've been going in through the front doors and fighting up. We're taking an incredible amount of casualties. Um, there's got to be a way, better way we do this. We got to get to the Piazza Municipality, which is at the end of the street in, in this particular photo. So Jim Jim Stone uh, radios Jim Jefferson, his commanding officer, and says, "Sir, listen, I've got an idea." I said, "Instead of clearing all these buildings one by one and, and taking casualties, what I want to do is I want to take a bunch of tanks and I want them to blast their air sirens, their horns." And I'm just going to drive these tanks and run the infantry down the street. We're not going to clear the houses. I'm going to assume some risk here. We're not going to clear these houses. We're just going to get down that street as fast as we can and try to gain as much ground, urban ground as possible. Jim Jefferson says, Jim, go ahead and do it. So this is what Stone does. It's called an urban penetration. In, in, in urban operations doctrine, it's called a penetration where you draw, where you literally force your troops and tanks and engineers down the street without clearing the buildings on either side. Now you gain a lot of space, you gain, you do it a lot quicker, but there's now the risk that you're leaving enemy behind you and up, up, uh, up above you who can fire into you as you do it. So Stone is taking a big risk here, um, but he does it successfully. Uh, surprisingly enough, he gets the tanks going. He's got the infantry to protect the tanks. He's got the engineers to run ahead and throw off landmines off to the side. And he's got the six pounder anti tank guns that are firing down, down the street, as are the tanks. And he, at the, the sirens are screaming, the horns are at their loudest. And Jim Stone does this penetration. He covers about 200 meters or so, 100 to 200 meters in like a few minutes. And it, maybe the German, now remember the Germans are trying to suck the Canadians down the center of the street. But for some reason, the Germans don't react. Either they're like, aha, they're falling for our plan, or they're like, uh-oh, we're going to get caught behind enemy lines. 
So amazingly, as the Canadians run down the street with the tanks, um, they don't get fired upon and they do this penetration and they get to this very large rubble pile, this huge rubble pile. It's got to be about 15, 20 feet high because of the collapsed building. And they get to this large rubble pile and the, the lead tank stops. The lead tank stops and, and Jim Stone runs up. And he bangs on the tank and he's like, what do you stop for? Keep going. And the tank commander's like, well, it looks like there might be a landmine out there and I don't want to go any further. And Jim Stone is like, I don't see any landmines. Well, it's under that piece of sheet metal right there. And Jim Stone is like, no, you got to keep going. You got to keep going. If the Germans see that we stopped, they're going to start firing on us. And the tank commander is like, this tank costs $20,000, not willing to risk it. And Jim Stone is like, every one of my infantry soldiers costs a million dollars. You don't see me stopping. And the tank commander is like, I'm not going further any for it. And now by now the Germans are realizing, oh, the Canadians have stopped. So now... They start taking fire from the Piazza Municipality in front of them. And Jim Stone's cursing. He's cursing at the tank commander. And now the Canadians bust in through the doors and they start clearing the buildings on either side of the course of Vittorio Emanuele because they're, they've stopped. They've lost the momentum. And so now they've got to start. They've got to get into the buildings that were away from the bullets. Right. So um, at this point, uh, it turns out that Jim Stone was wrong. It turns out there are landmines in front. Now, Jim Stone would later on in the day go back and he'd pick up the piece of sheet metal and there's nothing under it. And so Jim Stone was justified. But what happens is just before the rubble pile, there are a number of landmines and, and the Royal Canadian Engineer, George, Corporal George Campion, he runs out to try to clear these landmines. He understands the tanks have to get forward. He runs out and tries to huck these anti-tank, he tries to throw these anti-tank mines off to the side, but he gets... He's getting shot at by the Germans in the Piazza and Miss Valley. So George Campion takes a bunch of smoke grenades and he hucks, he throws a bunch of smoke grenades up in front of him and the smoke billows out. And it's, and now the Germans can't see anything. The engine, George Campion runs out in the middle of the street. He starts picking up any tank on that landmine, he's throwing them off the street, right? The smoke starts to clear. The machine gun bullets start coming in again. George Campion runs back, he grabs some more smoke grenades. He throws more smoke grenades out and with the smoke builds up into the street again. George Campion runs out, grabs more anti-tank landmines and starts throwing them off the, off the way. He gets the middle, he gets the middle, he is awarded the military medal for this, by the way, um, for this daring act. Unfortunately, unfortunately, he gets promoted to sergeant, which is great. Unfortunately, he gets killed in action many months from now um, uh, in Northern Italy, unfortunately. But here he is earning the military. Um, uh, Jim Stone says right bring the anti-tank guns up so uh, we're taking fire the Germans the Germans are shooting at us from the Piazza and Pali once again the loyal ladies daringly run these six pounder anti-tank guns up the street start firing the six pounder anti-tank guns um, at the Germans uh, within the Piazza and Pali itself um, now remember the Piazza and Pali is part of the main defensive area this is where the Germans want to destroy the Canadians um, so the Canadians have now made it up to the main defensive area. They've been successfully sucked in to the Piazza Municipality itself. Um, but there's this damn rubble pile that's still in the way. Um, right now, uh, that's uh, Major General Christopher Volks on the left. He is the uh, commander of the 1st Canadian Infantry Division. And of course, you remember Hoffey, uh, Brigadier Bertram Hoffmeister on the right side. He is the commander of the 2nd Canadian Infantry Brigade. Um, it is right now when Volks, it is on the evening of the 22nd, when Volks and Hoffy realize, oh my God, the Gustav line is not up by the Ariely River. They now realize that Ortona is the eastern anchor point of the Gustav line. And this is why the Germans are fighting so stubbornly for it. Um, they've both come to this realization now that this is not going to be just a loyal Edmonton Regiment fight. Because uh, it, it has been pretty much the loyal eddies with their supporting tanks and engineers and artillery guns up to this fight. So remember, this is what the Canadians think. This is the reality. Uh, this is the real. This is the Gustav line. So what does Volks do? Volks decides he's got to take his very tired and exhausted uh, 1st Canadian Infantry Brigade and 3rd Canadian Infantry Brigade and start pushing them up the west side of Ortona. While 2nd Canadian Infantry Brigade is going to fight inside the town, the remainder of the division's brigades will fight up the west side of Ortona. And maybe, just maybe, if they can get to the north side of Ortona, they can isolate the German paratroopers inside the town and destroy them. Uh, isolating that town will be critical so the Germans cannot continue to resupply and reinforce. So first brigade, so on this particular day, 
Uh, Volk says, right, tomorrow, gents, we've got to push 1st Canadian Infantry Brigade up the west side of the town. We'll follow it with the 3rd Brigade to see if we can isolate this town and cut them off, thereby destroying this part of the Gustav line. Uh, Hoffy, you've got to keep pushing your 2nd Brigade through this particular town. So Hoffy, on the left, turns to a Lieutenant Colonel Sid Thompson, who he promotes on this day. He promotes Sid Thompson to Lieutenant Colonel and says, Sid, I need, this, I need more C4ths into this fight. Um, the Loyal Eddies have done a great job, but obviously the Germans are putting up a lot of stubborn resistance. I need you to bring the Loyal, I need you to bring the C4ths into this fight. What I want you to do, Sid, is you need to take the C4ths up the west side of the town. I want you to cross behind the Loyal Eddies, get up to the west side of the town, and maybe you can flank the Piazza Municipality. And Sid Thompson's like, right off, right, Bert, I'll go do that. So the Loyal Edmonton Regiment um, gets into the Piazza. First of all, they spend the morning, the, the anti tank guns, um, at five o'clock in the morning, the anti-tank guns demonstrate their effectiveness as very violent alarm clocks. And these six-pounder anti-tank guns, uh, they start firing at the rubble pile so they can blow the rubble pile and its landmines and its booby traps into the, pia into the piazza so that um, we can get that, get that rubble pile shortened so the tanks can see over it. The tanks can start firing into the German positions. And that's exactly what happens. And then the loyal ladies creep into the piazza and they immediately start taking machine gun fire from five German machine guns and dozens of riflemen all around the piazza. So they break into the buildings and private Rattray of the loyal ladies. He brings two of his buddies. They crawl over the rubble pile. They, they run heroically, heroically, courageously run through all this machine gun fire, break into one of the buildings. Um, Rattray tells his two buddies, you take the guys on the main floor. He runs up to the second and third floors and kills and or, or, or takes prisoner on a couple of German machine gun positions and German soldiers that go along with him. And he would end up winning the military medal for this very daring act. The Piazza municipality, at this point, the urban geography, it splits into three roads. You've got the road that goes up to the Piazza Plebiscita. You've got another road that goes up to the Piazza San Tommaso and another road that goes over to the Corso Umberto. So uh, Colonel Jim Jefferson of the Loyal Eddies says, right, I've got to split. I've, once I get around this piazza, I've got to split my, my battalion into th those three companies in order to do that. But they have a really tough time because once again, this is the German main defensive area and the Germans are very determined to stop the Canadians here. So they have a very, so the, the Edmontons don't make a lot of gains in the piazza this day because there are so many Germans in, within, within the three tall buildings that it's quite stubborn. Uh, it's a very stubborn defense. Uh, member, Bert Hoffmeister had told Sid Thompson, you got to commit more C-force into this. Uh, Hoffy, or correction, Sid Thompson brings the battalion up to Piazza Vittoria and he pushes off Bravo Company off to the west down the Via Rapino um, so that they can get up to the Piazza San Francesco and he readies the rest of the battalion. He, he gives them a be prepared to task to move up to the west side of the town. But once again, the Germans are predicting this. And so they've got the, the, the C-force make maybe about 50 to 100 meters progress on this particular day. Very stubborn fighting by the Germans because they don't want the Canadians to flank the Piazza Municipality. Um, it's on this particular day that Captain Bill Longhurst really does something spectacular. You know, Bill Longhurst is the officer commanding Alpha Company of the Loyal Ladies. And he's been saying, Jesus, we've been going into the, to the, we've been going in through the ground floor going in through the doors and windows where there's booby traps and German riflemen and German machine guns. And we're just taking an enormous amount of casualties. And the Germans know we're doing this. They've got the initiative. The Germans know that we have to go through the front door and the window. But look at, look at the houses in Old Town here. Look at these houses, they're shoulder to shoulder. So Bill Longhurst, he gets into one building and he gets his troops to clear it. He, gets to, he kills the Germans inside of it. And then he gets to the top floor and he turns to his engineers and his pioneer soldiers, infantry pioneer soldiers, who are infantry soldiers that have been trained in engineer tasks. And he calls up his engineers and pioneers and he goes, right guys, here's what I want you to do. I want you to make an explosive and you know, I want you to put it against that wall and I want you to make a hole through the wall. And this way we're gonna go into the building and instead of clearing it from the top down, from the, from the bottom up, we're gonna make a hole, get into the top of the house and clear it top down because grenades are easier to throw downstairs and will surprise the Germans because they think we're coming in through the bottom. So his engineers built this explosive device. They blow it. They build a second one to blow a second hole. And Longhurst is like, go, go, go. He runs his troops in. 
They start clearing from the top of the house down. They're throwing grenades down, completely surprises the Germans. The Germans not expecting to be attacked from above. And they get down to the bottom and Bill Longers is like, do it again. They run up to the top of the house. They put more explosive charges on there and they go in through the hole and they clear from top down, clear from top down, clear from top down. They're doing this. The Germans on the other side of the street realize that the Canadians are now clearing from the top down and that they've actually progressed several houses down. So the Germans on the other side of the street start withdrawing because they don't want to be caught behind enemy lines. And so now the Canadians are effectively clearing both sides of the street by clearing just one side of the street. So this mouse holing technique, which had not been invented by the Canadians, it was actually in British urban operations doctrine. It was called the vertical technique by the British, but nobody had ever done it before because up to this point in the war, there's been no real extensive urban fighting. So Bill Longhurst just thought of this thing, even though it was already in British doctrine, Bill Longhurst thought of it and it flies around the brigade. Pretty soon the sea force are, are grabbing a lot of German anti-tank mines and rigging up little fuses and then and then blowing holes through walls so that they can clear from the top down as well. And this mouse holding technique becomes very successful. And the Canadians realize this has this is the way it has to be done um, because fighting from the top down is a lot easier than fighting from the bottom up. Not only that, but the engineers get very inventive uh, with their explosive devices. Uh, again, they're, muck, they're, they're grabbing German anti-tank mines. They've got their own explosive devices. Um, they're rigging up uh, improvised explosive devices to use for these mouse only techniques. And they soon realize that um, if we make these explosives big enough, there's, if there's Germans on the other side of the wall, if we make the explosives big enough, they'll, the, explosions, the explosives will detonate. It will actually kill or wound other German soldiers. We can throw grenades in and then fire our Tommy or our machine guns and we can kill the Germans on the other side of the wall quite easily. And so this mouse holding technique flies around the battalion and pretty soon the sea forths are now also employing it as well, which is uh, absolutely fantastic. Another great thing that occurs on this day um, to help the Canadians is that they use the, uh, the 90th anti-tank battalion positions two of their 17 pounder anti-tank guns um, 1500 yards to the Southeast of the town. Um, and remember these, 17, you can see the size of these 17 pounder guns on the, on the bottom photo. They're fairly sizable pieces of equipment. And so what they do is, uh, and later on, uh, the Colonel Booth, Lieutenant Colonel Booth, who's the commanding officer of the Three Rivers Regiment, he's gonna station three tanks co-located with the two 17 pounder guns. And they start firing 1500 yards across the, the, the waters of the Adriatic into the north end of the town at the German positions themselves to try to soften up these positions so that by the time the Canadians get there, uh, the Germans will have been killed in action, uh, which is great. So uh, J Troop of the 90th Anti-Tank Battery has these 17 pounder guns and they're the ones that are gonna position themselves southeast of the town and continue and firing all of their uh, uh, rounds and ammunition at Corso Umberto uh, at the, nor at the uh, northeast corner of the town. And you can see another wonderful painting by Charles Comfort um, showing the destruction that these two 17 pounder guns and the three tanks uh, from the three rivers regiment were to inflict on this particular part of uh, the northeast uh, corner of the town um, itself. But Comfort, I say wonderful paintings, by the way, because Comfort, I think, has a way of showing just the uh, enormous uh, level of destruction that uh, the Canes and the Germans uh, uh, did on, on this particular town itself. Well, that's another. That's another, again, it's the utilization of these weapon systems to do these kinds of things, which is one of the reasons why the Canadians will become successful in this particular battle. Uh, the 24th of December, um, right now, there's another major cause and effect, another decision being made, but this one made by the Germans. Remember the day before, on the 23rd, um, Hoffi has decided to commit more resources to the battle more the sea force are thrown into it he gets more tanks from the three rivers he's getting more engineers he's got the two 17 pounder anti-tank guns now creating the damage well the germans react and the germans reinforce um the second battalion of the third parachute regiment with another battalion of about 800 troops um second battalion of the fourth parachute regiment is now thrown into this particular battle so uh, normally when you go on the offense, you want a three to one ratio. Um, throughout this entire battle, it's pretty much a one to one ratio that the Canadians are fighting against. And because of the enormous amount of casualties, I would even, that they're taking in this urban operations battle, I would suggest that the, the odds are, the ratio is even less. So the fact that the Canadians are able to fight this battle and eventually win, 
um, is a is a momentous uh, victory because they were they were clearly outnumbered. Um, because of the casualties they were taking, the fact that the Germans have now on the 24th of December reinforced with an abs- another battalion of soldiers. Not only that, but Adolf Hitler is now getting involved. Adolf Hitler, very well known for his micromanaging of, uh, of this, uh, this entire war, says, I do not want Ortona to be lost. Ortona cannot be lost. It is the eastern anchor of the Gustav Line. You will fight tooth and nail to the last man. And, uh, and remember, this is the German main defensive area. So you got all these factors now uh, coming into this fight, uh, all this cause and effect coming into this fight. Loyal Eddies are still trying to fight through the Piazza Municipality on this day, and they'll eventually, slowly, because of the mouse holding technique, because they're using more tanks, um, because they're using more anti-tank guns, they're blasting away German positions. By the end of this day, they're able to work their way up to the north end of the Piazza Municipality. They're surprised by a flamethrower, one German daringly, with a flamethrower and and with a flame and these flamethrowers, um, they don't have very much range to them. They can maybe go maybe about 50 meters at the most. A German soldier daringly brings a flamethrower into this battle, and it scares the bejesus out of the because nobody wants to be burned alive. That's just the most horrific way to die. Um, it scares the bejesus out of the loyal Eddie. So, so so suddenly, they're bringing up anti tank guns and their soldiers who are who are crawling up into second story windows, firing away at this flamethrower and the flamethrower. The, the German with the flamethrower uh, withdraws from the from the particular fight around the Piazza Municipality. What's going on with the Seaforths on the west side? The Seaforths are able to make their way. Uh, Sid Thompson, he's got a beautiful view of a build. Uh, he's up in a high building in the Piazza Vittoria. He commits the rest of his companies uh, to go down the Via Rapino, and they're actually able to make their way to the Piazza San Francesco, which you see on the northwest side. To get to the Piazza San Francesco, and uh, just to see, you can see there's a diagram of the Piazza San Francesco on the left side. And as they approach it, uh, the soldiers see that there's a dead horse in the middle of the piazza that's been killed, perhaps by German artillery or mortar fire, or perhaps by Canadian artillery or mortar fire. And so now this Piazza San Francesco becomes Dead Horse Square and the Seaforts will nickname it as such for the remainder of the battle. Um, they're at the edge of Dead Horse Square and there's a school uh, right across from the church there's also a hospital right beside the church itself. And so they're, the sea forts are told, right, get into that school. Uh, a section of sea forts of about eight to 10 soldiers get into that school. Um, they're able to very easily, very easily uh, clear the Germans from the building. The Germans put up a very minor fight and then they withdraw from the building. And the sea forts were like, Jesus, that was the section of sea forts. These eight to 10 soldiers are like, geez, that was pretty easy. That was, I wonder, okay, well, we did pretty good there. Okay, we got the school. Hey, we got the school, we're good to go. Um, about 20 minutes later, after taking the school, a huge explosion occurs and the school implodes upon itself. Brick and mortar, wood flying everywhere as the, as the, as the school implodes itself. The Germans uh, put up such a small fight inside the school because they had wired the entire school for demolitions with demolitions and they wanted to suck the Canadians into this particular building so they could blow the school and their nefarious plan has now actually occurred and all of the soldiers save for one private Gordon Curry Smith are buried in the rubble or are buried alive in the rubble all the soldiers are killed except for Gordon Curry Smith he is alive underneath he's entombed under tons and tons and tons of rubble and he will remain there for three days, unbeknownst to the, to the Seaforths. He will remain every day um, uh, buried in the school for three days. And then the Germans do something that they haven't done up to this point in the battle at all. Um, they counterattack. They actually counterattack the Seaforths. Up to this point in the battle, they had not done that. Um, these are German paratrooper units. They're dismounted. They don't have tanks in support. Um, and so to counterattack would be a waste, a waste of resources. Um, this was a German SOP throughout both the Great War and the Second World War is that as soon as the Allies um, are able to take a piece of ground, the Germans would automatically counterattack because that's when the that's when you're most vulnerable. Um, the German paratroopers didn't do that. That was not their standard operational procedure because they found that it was a waste of resources. They would have too many losses. But up to this point, they decide to gamble and they had counterattack the Seaforths and they have a, a machine gun post up in the the bell tower of the cathedral you know, within a dead horse square itself. And that machine gun opens up the counterattack. And now they're starting to counterattack. Sid Thompson runs up 
and as the commanding officer of the sea forts and he uh, he's able to direct his companies to repel this attack they can't bring in artillery fire because the germans and the canadians are so close they're bare, they're 50 meters away uh fighting each other 50 meters away and um at this point sid thompson is trying to claw up a tank and a, a three rivers tank a three rivers regiment tank uh commanded by corporal gordon turnbull um is able to weasel its way up into the up at the dead horse square around the rubble and Sid Thompson's like, I want you to destroy the machine gun up in the church bell. It's the day before Christmas, and Gord Turnbull, Gord Turnbull is like, you want me to destroy a church on the day before Christmas? And Sid Thompson's like, there's a machine gun up there. And Turnbull's like, all right. So with one well-placed shot, boom, he destroys the he destroys the bell tower on top of the cathedral. And, and uh, with that, uh, along with Sid Thompson's direction to his soldiers, he's running around directing this this now defensive fight, he's able to repel the counterattack and kill uh, many Germans uh, as a as a result. And this is what occurs um, on the 24th of December um, within on in in Ortona itself. <clears throat> and you can see there uh, the church uh, with its destroyed tower, and uh, it will uh, within the next day or two, it's going to take a marvelous amount, uh, an absolutely amazing amount of violence is thrown into that building because the Germans and Canadians not only will fight into it, not fight in, they will not only fight inside of it, um, but they're gonna, they're gonna pound it with all kinds of artillery and tank fire as well. 25th of December is Christmas day, and it looks like the fighting is going to continue, and it does. Uh, the fighting, uh, the violence will continue on this particular day. The C4 Highlanders of Canada um, will, bring up, um, uh, will bring up eight tanks, two troops of tanks, eight tanks, and they'll start blasting away at the church um, to uh, to destroy uh, the German positions uh, with inside, inside the church. And the Canadian soldiers are actually able to get inside the church, and uh, the remaining German soldiers and they they fight for the the morning um, as the Canadians are on one side behind the pews, and the Germans are up at the altar stone. Uh, they they fight for several hours, throwing grenades and, and small arms fire at each other um, uh, throughout uh, this particular fight up at the uh, Piazza Municipality, the Loyal Eddies um, are on the north end of the of the uh, of the uh, Piazza Municipality. They're at the south end of the Piazza Plebiscita. There is a huge rubble pile, huge rubble pile at the south end of the Piazza and the tanks can't get around this rubble pile. Um, they try to bring up anti-tank guns, but the Germans within Piazza Plebiscita have their machine guns sighted in such a way that they can fire um, at the uh, anti-tank guns. Bombardier uh, Doucette from New Brunswick um, uh, brings up his daringly brings up his six pounder anti tank gun and with round after round after round as he's taking fire from German machine guns and snipers and marksmen he daringly uh, by himself is loading and firing the six pounder anti tank gun and blows down the rubble pile enough that a tank can actually get up to the rubble pile um, where the rubble pile protects the, the hull of the tank but the turret and the cannon can see over it and he just the, the tank just starts firing away at German positions around Piazza Plebiscita. So Bombardier Doucette ends up winning the military medal. Meanwhile, the Loyal Eddies are just happy and fine on Corso Umberto. They're happy and fine with the 17 pounder anti-tank guns and the three tanks of the Three Rivers Regiment just blasting away at the Corso Umberto. Uh, that's not, we don't need to move. <laughs> um, those tank and anti-tank guns are destroying enough Germans that we can just sit here and just let that happen. Remember, it's also Christmas day. And I think being killed on Christmas Day is also akin to being killed on the last day of a war. There's not real much motivation amongst the loyal Eddies to fight this battle today because it's Christmas Day. Um, thankfully, the quartermasters from both battalions have been working hard to try to do something special on Christmas Day. Um, the quartermaster for the, uh, the loyal Eddies is able to bring up some pork chops and a couple of bottles of beer and uh, some, some vegetables and some other fare. And bring it up to the front front, bring it right up to the Piazza Municipality. And the Loyal Eddie, Edmonton Regiment soldiers are able to suck back about 100 meters and undercover and into the buildings um, where they can where, where they can eat the eat the pork, eat the cold, the eat the cold pork chop really quickly, have, guzzle down the beer and then run back up to the to the front lines. Um, the C fourths, however, the C fourths decide to do it in a little more style and panache this day. Captain DB Cameron is the quartermaster for the C fourths. He had gone up to Sid Thompson, the commanding officer of the C4th the day before. And he says, hey, Colonel, um, it's Christmas Day tomorrow. I've got an idea. 
maybe we can put on a Christmas dinner for the troops in Santa Maria de Constantinople. Sid Thompson, he takes the risk. He understands, okay, this is what we'll do. We'll, we'll pull a company out at a time. Um, we'll pull a company out of a dead horse square at a time. And we'll pull them back to the church of Santa Maria de Constantinople. I just love saying that word. And uh, that's where we'll have Christmas dinner. So Captain Cameron and a sergeant go around the countryside and they beg, borrow and borrow, read, steal, all kinds of cutlery and, and uh, plates and all kinds of food uh, and all kinds of fare uh, for, the, for the C4 soldiers. Well, listen to this, in a battle zone, um, soup, roast pork, vegetables, mashed potatoes, gravy, Christmas pudding, mince pies, chocolate, nuts, fresh fruit, and the most important thing ever, cigarettes and beer um, for, for the troops. And so uh, Sid Thompson brings one company back at a time. You can see them there in the oratory of the church and look at the smiles on those faces. Like they're, they've been thrown into this urban hell. And yet here is uh, Captain Cameron and Colonel Thompson pulling them back one company at a time so they can enjoy this smorgasbord of a feast. Um, the, the sounds of battle just a few hundred meters away, the artillery following, the tanks firing. Etc. But look at the smiling faces and some of these troops in this photo, by the way, some of these troops in this, in this photo will be dead in a few hours. Um, but Sid Thompson and, and Captain Cameron able to give them um, that fantastic meal. And then once they were done, it started at 11 o'clock. Each company got it two hours to eat this smorgasbord of food and they rotated out. So it started at 11, 1, 3 and 5 p.m. By the time the last company finished, it was 7 p.m. And they rotated back up to Dead Horse Square to continue uh, the fight. Meanwhile, as the sea force are enjoying the smorgasbord, the eight, tank, the eight tanks from the Three Rivers Regiment are blasting away at the church. And that's why you see Charles Comfort's painting there of the church in its rubbled state uh, to try to destroy the Germans, uh, destroy the Germans there. Um, this is not only a momentous day because it's Christmas, but it's a momentous day because the Germans have realized they've lost Ortona. Uh, First Canadian Infantry Brigade is slowly and stubbornly fighting its way up the west side. Third Canadian Infantry Brigade will do a, what we call a forward passage of lines and they'll continue the fight up the west side. And now Ortona looks like it could be isolated. First German Parachute Division is fighting very stubbornly west of the town because they don't want to lose Ortona. They don't want Ortona to be isolated. So it's a very stubborn fight. But First Brigade is making some pretty good progress. And so right now the Germans are thinking, oh, oh we have lost Ortona, we, we're gonna lose it. And so uh, you can see uh, Field Marshal Albert Kesselring, smiling Albert, as he's called, because he's always a gentleman who's smiling away. He is actually the commander of all German forces within Italy. He's talking to the 10th Army Commander, General Lemelson, and he's saying, right, um, uh, I, just, we, I just don't think Ortona is worth it anymore. Um, we're losing 1st German Parachute Division in this horrendous battle, um, both west of the town and inside the town of itself. Um, you'll notice that um, the, based on the discussion there, Ortona is now making headlines around the world. The, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation's Matthew Halton is broadcasting live from Ortona, and it's now being called Little Stalingrad um, after that huge, human, humongous uh, German and Russian urban operations battle that just happened a year before in December, in uh, November to February of 1942. Um, oh, correction, November 1942 to February 1943, this humongous urban operations, extremely violent urban operations battle in Stalingrad on the Eastern Front. Well, people are now calling Ortona Little Stalingrad. Um, uh, and that's making headline news. And the Germans are noticing this. And they're like, holy cow. They're blowing this battle way out of proportion, but we have to hold it. It's the Eastern Anchor of the Gustav Line, but it's Christmas Day. It's Christmas Day, the, the overwhelming. So you've got Little Stalingrad, the press making such a big deal out of it. It's making world headlines. You've got this, you've got the Canadians who are violently applying force with everything. The Loyal Eddies, um, the, the, the Sea Force with their anti-tank guns, their tanks, their engineers are just destroying everything. This overwhelming violence that the, the Germans within the town are just being destroyed at the Piazza Municipality, Piazza Plebiscita, Dead Horse Square. Um, it looks like they're just going to be destroyed outright. And so all these factors with one brigade out west, uh, slowly working their way to the town, the Germans are like, we're gonna lose it. We've got we've to withdraw from, from the town itself. 
what's the cunning plan then? What's the cunning plan for the Germans? Well, they're going to install a deception plan beginning the next day on the 26th. And they're going to, they're going to make it look like they're not going to leave the town by just destroying more of the town. Um, apply more violence. Make the Canadians think that we're here to stay. Um, and that's exactly what they do. So more houses are being destroyed. Trams are being destroyed and flipped over as obstacles on the streets. Um, more explosives, more landmines are being thrown out into the streets or being set throughout the buildings. Um, over the radio, the Canadians pick up um, over the German radio that Operation Ortona, a counterattack is going to occur within the town. Falk Wolf 190 fighter pilots are now flying over the town and strafing the town to make the Canadians think that the Germans are not leaving. And so what do the Canadians do? Um, okay, you want to play that game, we're going to play that game too, and we're going to get more violent. We're going to become more violent than you. And that's exactly what happened on this particular day. Uh, the Lower Ladies and the Three Rivers and the threat and the Royal Canadian Engineers and the artillery six-pounder tank, anti-tank guns start blowing away the rubble pile at the south end of the Piazza Plebiscita, and they start blowing away at all the German positions. Two German anti-tank guns, which the Germans have dismantled and reassembled on the second store uh, story of, of two buildings, destroy three, uh, two of the tanks in Piazza Plebiscita. Like, where did those come from? So now they got to bring more tanks in to destroy, to find these anti-tank guns, which are inside the buildings on the second story uh, to try to destroy these, uh, destroy these um, uh, anti-tank guns and the other German positions within Piazza Plebiscita. The Loyal Eddies now, another company is making its way slowly up Piazza up Santa Maso. And there's another company slowly making its way up Corso Umberto with the anti-tank guns and three rivers still southeast of the town, still blasting away at the northeast of the town, as you can see by the red line and the, uh, and the explosions there. The C4s, the Highlanders of Canada are like, right, let's start ramping it up. Let's start ramping up the violence. Um, with those eight tanks, they're blowing away more German positions. They're blowing away. They're destroying the hospital. They're blowing away at the church. Um, unbeknownst to the Three Rivers Regiment, there's um, there's a couple of dozen civilians inside a woodshed beside the beside the church, and the Three Rivers Regiment blow destroy the woodshed, um, killing many or Tonesi. Unfortunately, again, this is the, the 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 challenge of having civilians in the battle space, and there I can tell you, there's many more civilians that have been killed from both Canadian and German artillery fire. Just absolutely horrific. But the, now the Seaforths make their way through Piazza San Francesco and they start mopping up the remnants of whatever Germans are left there. And they start making their way up via, via Monte Mayella. They're trying to link up with the Loyal Edmonton Regiment up at Piazza Plebiscito. Um, back, back, at, uh, back the flamethrower, the, the German flamethrower makes his appearance once again uh, against the Loyal Ladies at the Piazza Plebiscito. But they're ready for him this time. Any tank guns begin firing away. And they destroy the building that the flamethrower, and they collapse the building upon the uh, uh, so this incredible level of violence uh, once again occurring uh, on this day. It is just absolutely insane now uh, what the Germans and the Canadians are doing to each other uh, as they're as the Canadians are literally inching their way up to the north end of the town. This is the last day of fighting in Artona. The Canadians don't know that. The Germans know it. Uh, the Germans are going to fight this day, and then they're going to, the, this, the evening of the 27th, they're going to withdraw from the town itself. Um, but they're going to put up one hell of a fight still uh, to make the Canadians, uh, to make it appear um, that, uh, that they're going to fight. Hofmeister, the brigade commander, the two brigade commander, Hofmeister, he sees that the loyal ladies and the Seaforths are just, they're just about there. You know, Chris Vokes had come to him the day before, the division commander, Chris Vokes had come to him the day before on the 26th and said, Bert, we're taking a lot of casualties here. Do you want to withdraw? And Hoffie's like, no, no. The light's at the end of the tunnel now, Chris. The light's at the end of the tunnel. We're almost there. Um, if we withdraw the brigade, we will have incurred all these casualties and this level of violence for absolutely nothing. We've got to see this through to the end. And Chris Vokes is like, all right, Bert, it's your fight. You keep going. And so on this day, the Seaforths, um, they've had enough of the Germans. And as they're advancing up via Monte Mayela, um, Delta Company on the left side of the road, Charlie Company is on the right side of the road. Uh, Delta Company seems to be making very good progress. Charlie Company is not. They get to a factory and the Germans are being very stubborn. Um, Charlie Company gets a platoon of about 30 soldiers into this factory basement. 
Uh, but the Germans are still being very stubborn. Sid Thompson's had enough. He's like, the Germans want to play this game. We're going to play this game too. He withdraws the company complete. He sends engineers and infantry pioneer soldiers into the basement of the factory where they have four pound to 25 pound demolition charges. He wires the entire basement of the building. He pulls them out. He blow and the entire building implodes upon it, killing all the Germans inside. The Germans want to play this game. Then we're going to play this game too. Unfortunately, the Germans are done playing this game. On the 27th, uh, Lieutenant, um, uh, Lieutenant Allen of the Loyal Eddie, he's just taking a platoon over. Uh, his nickname is Bunny, by the way, Bunny Allen. I, please, I, the sources don't tell me why his nickname is Bunny Allen. But uh, Lieutenant Bunny Allen, he has his platoon safely ensconced inside a building on the, on the evening of the 26th to the 27th of December. On the morning of the 27th of December, the Germans have also wired this building to blow and they destroy the building and the entire building collapses on a platoon of about 30 to 35 Loyal Edmonton Regiment soldiers. <clears throat> and the, the Loyal Eddies see this, this whips around the brigade that uh, this has happened to this platoon of Loyal Eddie soldiers and the Canadians are now enraged. They are angry that the Germans have done this, um, uh, done this to their platoon and Bill Longhurst uh, the company commander who had come up with the mouse holing, who had, who had started the mouse holing technique, Bill Longhurst calls up his engineers and pioneers and says, right, we're doing the same thing. They safely crawl forward. They get into a couple of buildings. They find two more buildings that are housing Germans. Uh, there's a German commander there berating his, his, his soldiers, saying that the Canadians, it's not acceptable that the Canadians have come this far. The engineers wire these buildings. Bill Longhurst pulls out. Boom, huge explosion. Both these buildings are collapsed one after the other, killing the Germans inside. This is how vindictive um, this fighting has now become um, uh, within the... Uh, um, but uh, because of the level of, of, of violence that's now being applied by the Canadians, they're now able to get through the Piazza Plebiscita, um, where the Seaforths and the Loyal Eddies link up. Um, they're able to get up the west side of Piazza San Tommaso. The Loyal Eddies have now gone up the Corso Umberto to the east side of Piazza San Tommaso and where they can effectively control the square of Piazza San Tommaso um, with a fire for, with the machine gun positions from the buildings. And meanwhile, um, Lieutenant Colonel Jim Jefferson of the Loyal Eddies orders a mortar shoot. He's like, he's done with it too. He's like, right, the Germans, I've had enough of this. And so he orders 1100 mortar rounds to fall just northeast of uh, the Loyal Eddies on the northern end of the town to, to destroy any German positions there. And meanwhile, the anti-tank guns, the 17-pounder anti-tank guns and the tanks just southeast of the town begin destroying the, the castle and the, ten, and the entrance to the tunnel because there was a worry that the Germans were reinforcing with more troops in the castle. And there was a worry that there might be a large gun inside the tunnel. Both of these turned out to be false. But at this point of the battle, the Canadians are so enraged, are so angry, and are so determined to win. Um, the loss of Canadian life has been so regretful that now the Canadians are willing to apply overwhelming violence to settle this once and for all. And that is, uh, and that is what happens to occur on this particular day. And um, at, in the very, the, the fighting stops at the end of the day, and the Germans very quietly, without the Canadians knowing it. Germans quietly withdraw from Ortona. Um, both of the second battalions of the third and the fourth regiments uh, withdraw and take several hours to move northwest of the town where they link up with the rest of first German parachute division um, at the uh, Licchio River just northwest of the town. <clears throat> There's the Piazza Plebiscito by the time the Canadians and the Germans had stopped firing had stopped uh, fighting for it. Once again, Charles Comfort with his, uh, with his wonderful paintings showing the on the 28th of December, the Patricias uh, with a B squadron of the Three Rivers Regiment, uh, they do a forward passage of lines. They pass through the Loyal Edmonton Regiment and they go up to Via Tripoli. And uh, meanwhile, the rest of the Loyal Edmonton Regiment, Lieutenant Alan Johnson, the scout platoon commander, uh, the, the Pensioni, so famously named after him at the south end of the town, he's walking up to the north end of the town. He meets a bunch of German, a uh, correction, a bunch of Ortonesi, and uh, he's figured out that the Germans have withdrawn from the town. Um, one of the German, a correction, one of the Italian civilians um, very cheekily says, I don't know what took you so long. There weren't, so many, there weren't very many Germans here. Um, <laughs> but uh, 
and this gets radioed back. There's some Italian civilians who bump into Sid Thompson's headquarters and they also say to him, hey, the Germans have withdrawn. It is now verified. The Patricias and the Three Rivers Regiment uh, move northwest of the town where they uh, fight some minor skirmishes just northwest of the town. But it is now very clear that uh, the Germans now have withdrawn. Very smartly, Hoffi brings his anti his uh, air defense weapons in to the town. The Germans now know that the Canadians have, have possession of the town. And so Hoffi realizes he's not has to bring some air defense weapons in. And uh, he very does, he very rightly does so. And sure enough, not more than an hour later, uh, German fighter aircraft come in to strafe and bomb the town. Luckily, no casualties are incurred. And they do this two or three times throughout the 28th of December. And uh, as a result, um, uh, as a, one of the German fighter, fighter uh, air, aircraft is actually shot down due to the air defense, good to go for the Royal Canadian artillery and that. Uh, but this effectively ends the urban battle of Ortona itself. Um, we'll now go into post-battle events. Um, one of the pleasant surprises that I had when I was up at the uh, Library and Archives Canada as I was going through the Loyal Edmonton Regiment War Diary was I found these two very, uh, very accurate uh, hand-drawn sketches that were in the Loyal Edmonton Regiment's War Diary. Uh, an absolute surprise to me after all the research I had done, I had not seen these sketches at all in any of the primary or secondary sources. And this, to me, this was a gold mine. And I had to put this into my thesis because it, I had never seen it before. The sketch on the left showing two brigades layout in the town after the battle. You can see the Loyal Edmonton Regiment in the south in Old Town, and you can see them circled in blue. And you can actually see little red circles with uh, lines and arrows. Those are the platoons and the companies. Um, that were laid out and the, uh, the, those arrows um, signify the, uh, the arcs of observation and fire uh, that the Loyal Edmonton Regiment had laid out in the south end of the town. The Patricias are in the northeast of the town at Piazza San Tommaso in the cemetery. And then the Seaforths are around Dead Horse Square and the western side of the town. That's the drawing on the left. That's the defensive plan of Ortona. And on the right, there must've been a rotation because on the right, the sketch on the right shows the Loyal Edmonton Regiment now in the Piazza San Tommaso and the buildings in red are the buildings that the Canadian soldiers of, from the Loyal Eddies were actually staying in. So what a gold mine to find this though, because again, you don't find this in any of the sources at all. Um, absolutely wonderful. So for the next four months, the next four months, the Canadians will stay in Ortona. Ortona now becomes a rest and recreation area and the Canadians now have to help clean up the town after the awesome amount of destruction that the town has suffered through, um, the Canadians are cleaning up the town. Private Gordon Curry Smith, the Seaforth, who had been buried under the rubble um, in Dead Horse Square, uh, back, uh, back in Piazza San Francisco, amazingly lives, for, lives under the rubble for three days and is discovered on the 27th of February by his fellow Seaforths and he is dug out. They are now that the Germans have been kicked out of the square, they, uh, the C Fourth Infantry soldiers with the engineers um, are are moving big piles of rubble, getting tanks to move big piles of rubble, and they find Gordon Curry Smith three alive three days under the rubble. Um, Bunny Allen's platoon that had been killed uh, from the Loyal Eddies that had been collapsed. Um, one survives. Lance Corporal Roy Boyd is discovered on the 30th of December, three days also alive underneath the rubble. Two of his fellow loyal ladies, you can see them there. They find him. Uh, they find him. He is able, after three days, he can't speak, he, but he, he is, his throat is so dry, um, but he musters up the, the, the will to shout out to his friends. And uh, they, they find him. They shove a pipe into the rubble to give him some fresh air. And then they spend the next hour digging Roy Boyd out of the rubble. And uh, both Gordon Curry Smith and Roy Boyd survived the battle and the war. Um, after three days under, after three days under the war, um, absolutely amazing. The poor, Ortona's poor civilians, the Ortona SE, many killed in the fight by both Canadians and Germans as a result of the tank and small arms fire, the artillery fire, the mortar fire, <clears throat> excuse me, the, uh, the German demolitions, the booby traps, the explosive devices, so many civilians killed. Um, but uh, for the next four months, the Canadians do redeem themselves. They stay, they turn Ortona into a rest and rest recreation area for the Ortona SE that come back uh, to the town, that come back to the, to the town itself. The Canadians 
will give them um, medical aid, uh, food, water. Um, they will, the engineers and the pioneer soldiers will uh, very, um, will uh, painstakingly go uh, throughout the town and remove all of the improvised explosive devices, booby traps and landmines and clear the town. Uh, the engineers and the infantry pioneers also, also verify the structural integrity of the buildings to make sure that no more buildings collapse on the on Ortona civilians. Um, uh, they begin paying the Ortona civilians, the Ortonesi for services. Uh, they pay them to remove the rubble from the streets. Um, uh, they pay them to help remove mud from uh, the tracks of the tanks. They pay them for barber, tailor, laundering services. Um, a lot of the Ortonesi begin inviting the Canadian soldiers into their homes for home cooked meals, for social events, bingo, chess, um, the, the Canadians endear themselves to the Ortonesi for the next four months, um, doing a number of things, not only the demining and the booby traps, not only checking, checking the structures, but cleaning up the houses, pumping out polluted water wells. Uh, the Canadian soldiers and the, the Ortonesi have a bath and shower nights, film nights, and again, they're turning it into a rest and recreation area. Every once in a while, the Germans remind the Canadians that are, they're at war by dropping artillery rounds on, on Ortona. They seem to do so. The Germans love to enjoy dropping uh, Ortona round, or rounds on Ortona whenever the Seaforths were practicing with their bagpipes. For some reason, that seemed to up the German uh, will to drop uh, artillery rounds on the, on the town itself. Um, uh, of course, Canadians being Canadian troops, um, there is some looting in the town, unfortunately, by Canadian soldiers. Uh, the military police are called in to inev inevitably, as, uh, as David will attest to, inevitably arrest uh, Canadian troops for drunkenness, um, such as the life with, with Canadian soldiers. Um, but for the next four months, the Canadians do help the Ortonesi clean up the town and establish this absolutely wonderful relationship, which, which has paid forward for decades. And, uh, and if you go into Ortona now, um, monuments to where uh, certain aspects of the battle occurred, the museum now for the Battle of Ortona, Piazza Canada, the renaming of uh, one of the piazzas to Piazza Canada. Um, as you can see there, the, uh, the, the pastor of uh, Santa, uh, Piazza Santa Masso, uh, giving the symbolic piece of wood to the Canadian soldiers there. Um, so just an absolutely wonderful, the Canadian, the fact that Canadians redeem themselves by cleaning up the town. But unfortunately, the other frequent thing is as they're cleaning up the town, they are finding the bodies of not only the Ger of the Ortona civilians, but of course of their fellow Canadian soldiers and their German soldiers. And you can see on the left, the lower ladies having a ceremony in February um, for the soldiers killed in and around Ortona. And on the right, the actual uh, cemetery itself uh, dedicated to those who fought in and around Ortona being dedicated in April of 1944. You can see the casualty numbers there um, for the loyal ladies, 109 wounded, uh, 63 killed in action in this urban fight. Uh, the Seaforth, 62 wounded, 41 killed, the Three Rivers Regiment, uh, 20 wounded and four killed, supporting not only the 2nd Brigade, but the 1st and the 3rd Brigade fighting out west of the town. 1st uh, German Parachute Division uh, also taking a large amount of casualties in this particular fight as well. Um, although they, the, the numbers are never confirmed, those are the nearest numbers that the sources can give us. Uh, so, all right, all right, ladies and gentlemen, that is... Uh, that is the end of the urban operations battle of Ortona as we move into a conclusion and the question period. I'll just say uh, as a conclusion, again, another wonderful painting by Charles Comfort, uh, 25 pounder gun uh, near Ortona. Um, the Germans had a lot going for them. The Germans had a lot going for them. And, you know, uh, I think now Canadian history realizes um, that the Germans really rewrote the history of the Second World War. Um, um, you know, the Germans uh, tried to make people believe that they were a, a race of supermen who could hold the Allies at bay with inferior forces. Um, in this particular case, this was a, basically a one-to-one -one ratio, and maybe even less when you consider the amount of casualties that were taken by the Canadians. Um, uh, the Germans had a lot going for them. Yes, okay, you can certainly say that as paratroopers, they were very determined. Uh, they were you could, uh, very professional, very determined soldiers, although sometimes um, they're not, uh, they're, they're guilty of war crimes as well. And there's times where German paratroopers have, have executed uh, prisoners of war and executed uh, Italian civilians throughout the Italian campaign. But uh, very determined, very professional soldiers when it comes to the business of soldiering itself. Um, they've had weeks and weeks and weeks of preparation. 
um, in, in and west of Ortona. They've got the natural and urban geography. They've got the natural geography of urban be, of Ortona being built on a plateau of the Adriatic the Sea to the east and the steep cliffs and the ravines to the west, um, which does not allow the town to be flanked um, at all. They've got uh, the railway tunnel, which allows them to be sheltered uh, from artillery fire. Um, a lot of the houses in Ortona as natural fortified strong points. Um, the element of surprise, this is the Gustav line. This is the Eastern Anchor, the Gustav line that the Canadians have no clue until the 23rd of December when they're in the middle of the fight, when they realize it's the Gustav line. And they only needed to really commit small forces at a time. At any, at any one time, there's maybe only a hundred German soldiers fighting the loyal ladies and, the, and the, another hundred fighting the, the sea force because they can, rotate, they can rotate their soldiers in and out of the battle from the railway tunnel. Um, such as the life of, uh, such as the, such as what occurs when you're on the defense in an urban fight. Um, so how did the Canadians win? Uh, the Canadians won because they took their weapon systems. They remember the Canadians weren't, the Canadians didn't think they were fighting, going to be fighting an extensive urban battle, remember? Uh, they'll be there for a day or two and then the Germans will leave. So they didn't go in with all the tools and equipment that we can give modern soldiers nowadays. Um, they went in with weapon systems and they improvised the use of those weapon systems. Um, they brought in the anti-tank guns. The engineers improvised explosive devices and larger explosive devices to do the mouse holing. Um, if there was a if there was a German if there were German soldiers on top floors that were being particularly stubborn, the engineers would take about thirty pounds of eight oh eight plastic explosive, put it on a chair, rig up a fuse, withdraw, and with thirty pounds of plastic explosive, there really, when that went off, usually there are no more top floors to clear anymore because the whole house had imploded upon itself. Um, so it's this improvisation of weapon systems of using the six and 17 pounder anti-tank guns of the engineers using various explosive devices in unique ways, the mouse holing technique uh, as an example, um, making sure that the tanks were in involved in this fight. It has been proven throughout urban operations, military history that you must have armored fighting vehicles in urban operations. You just have to give them lots of protection and uh, with the Three Rivers Regiment in support and the infantry protecting those tanks really well. Um, so you have good tank infantry, uh, engineer artillery cooperation, so good tactics, uh, the Canadians working together, um, the mouse holding technique that was started by uh, Bill Longhurst, and finally, pure determination, anger and rage is what allowed, is another thing that um, allowed the Canadians to win this fight. And uh, guess what, the Germans aren't supermen. Uh, the Canadians can hold their own. Now, um, there are other urban operations battles that occur in the Second World War. Um, of course, there's the massive battle between the Germans, the Germans and Russians in Stalingrad the year before. Um, the Americans, the Big Red One, the 1st Infantry Division, so-called the Big Red One, because they have a Big Red One as their divisional patch. They throw two battalions into the fight in Aachen in uh, October of 1944, and the Americans do a very, very good job there. Um, and then, of course, there's the fighting in Manila in the Philippines. There's the fighting in Berlin in uh, April and May of 1945. The Canadians are not the only subject matter experts on urban operations that come out of the Second World War. But Ortona is one of the first really hardcore urban operations. And the Canadians were fantastic in this particular fight because of the reasons I just told you about. In fact, many Canadian officers would be told and directed go off because there were more urban fights coming, um, especially when the Canadians were fighting through Northwest Europe. Um, uh, the Canadians went out and, and did visits with a number of other allied units passing on the lessons learned that they did at Ortona. So even though Ortona was only a small urban operations fight compared to the larger urban operations fight that we see later in the war, it was only a brigade, whereas other urban operations fights had entire armies sometimes or divisions committed to them. Um, the Canadians nevertheless proved that, that they were very good at doing this particular job of urban fighting. And what surprised me um, when I was doing the research is that Brereton Greenhouse, who used to work at the Department of History and Heritage, rest in peace, and David Brickusen were even questioning, oh, you know, why, did, why was Ortona even fought? Um, the Canadians didn't really need to fight in Ortona. And they brought this up within their particular, um, uh, within their particular works. And, um, you know, all the Canadians could have bypassed the town. And David Brickusen even goes so far as to say, well, I mean, look at Dunkirk. Um, when the Allies were passing through, were fighting through Northwest Europe, they, they bypassed Dunkirk. Why didn't they just do the same thing in Ortona? 
And I found that Greenhouse and Bercusen had very daringly used retrospective arguments to try to prove their point. Um, oh yeah, and there's a lot of violence in, our urban, in, in this urban fight. So maybe the Canadians shouldn't have fought it. Uh, they should have just bypassed the town. One, Highway 16 was the divisional axis of advance. It was the main logistical supply route. Um, two, um, bypassing the town is something that you never did in the Second World War, uh, if you could afford to it, because I don't think the Canadians would have been too happy having two battalions, two battalions of like 1500 soldiers uh, behind them. Um, that's something that you didn't really want. Um, as you're as you're fighting throughout the Italian campaign, um, you can bypass Dunkirk in Northwest Europe because by this time the Allies have so many roads and so much of the country that they can do that they can bypass Dunkirk. It serves no no reason to fight in it. Um, so um, the Canadians couldn't bypass Ortona; they had to take the town. And and in the Second World War, if the Germans were there, you went and destroyed them. Um, that's it's that sometimes it can be that simple. So that's why the the Canadians had to fight in Ortona. And by golly, they did a fantastic job in, in showing that they could do this particular type of task well. Okay. Thank you, uh, Major Drew, for this really comprehensive, intelligent uh, presentation on the urban battle for Ortona. I really learned a lot and I was riveted. I really was. I listened to it with great uh, interest as many of our listeners did this evening. So I'd also like to thank Captain Hughes for his introduction of our speaker. If you have a question, now is the time to ask. I do have a question in the chat. So I'm just going to uh, go look, at, look that up. Hang on a second. Uh, Phil asked a question uh, right off, right off the, at the very start. He said, uh, perhaps you can just give us a, a short list or perhaps you can uh, provide that to us. Um, are there any good military histories of the Second World War from the German side? He said uh, regarding tactical, operational Second World War histories of the German army. So now I am going to ask you to unmute yourself, uh, Jason. Okay. Um, there are if you speak German. Um, but if you don't speak German, there's not a lot. And I found that when I was, uh, when I was uh, researching uh, the Germans on this particular battle that there were not a lot of resources that I go to. So I had to really stick to the primary and secondary sources or correction, the, uh, the, a lot of the secondary sources. There are a few, uh, very few books out there that have been translated from German into English about individual soldiers' experiences um, uh, on, on, on all the fronts, on the Eastern Front, the Western Front, the Southern Front of the Second World War. And in fact, I've got... Um, my li I'm, I'm in my man cave here and uh, my library over there, I've, I've, I do have a German section. So if you give me a few minutes after, um, a Guy Sager is the, is the name that comes to mind immediately now who had fought on the Eastern Front. Um, uh, and he's, he has two or three books out. There's other books out there as well. And of course you can always just do the internet thing and go on the internet and find, uh, just punch in into Google, um, you know, books from the German side of the war and you'll, they'll probably give you a, a longer list. Um, but there are, uh, but they're very few in number. And uh, if you want, Philip, if you want to hang on afterwards, I, uh, I can pop over to my library right here and just quickly look at the books I do have and give you a quick list um, if you want. Um, but most of those books are very much at the hardcore individual soldiers level. Um, not a lot on the operational or strategical side of the war. I mean, the strategic side has been done to death by historians who will talk about Hitler and how he fought the war on both fronts and all that kind of stuff. There's another question from, the, and, and, and uh, I'm just going to go through the questions in the chat. Uh, uh, Cynthia, uh, Dr. Cynthia Wallace Casey asked, you speak of the great destruction of the historic cathedrals. Uh, have they been restored and where, where were the relics kept during the war? Uh, yes, they all have been restored, thankfully. Um, uh, most, of the, most of Ortona has been restored, uh, but especially the churches, uh, Piazza. If, uh, uh, I have not visited Ortona. I have only visited Ortona on Google Street View. Um, and very luckily, if you go to go or, uh, Google Street View, you can go through almost the entirety of Ortona and see the Piazza San Tommaso has been completely restored. Piazza San, the Church of Santa Maria de Grazi in Piazza San Francesco and, um, and, uh, and also the Church of Santa Maria de Constantinople as well has, uh, has also been uh, fully restored, thankfully. A lot, uh, many of the, when the Germans did the 
Not so much in Santa Maria de Constantinople. It only had the artillery rounds fall on it. And then there was some fighting within the, within the church between the sea force near the beginning of the battle. Uh, but of course, Piazza San Francisco was completely destroyed and completely restored. And a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of the relics inside of it were, were destroyed as well. Um, Piazza San Tommaso, surprisingly, because remember it was just cleaved in half. Um, so anything on the cleaved, on anything that fell on the rubble side was certainly destroyed. Amazingly, they were able to save some of the relics and some of the ancient or some of the artifacts that were on the side that were not destroyed. And very thankfully, when the loyal ladies got up to the Piazza San Tommaso, they didn't actually fight inside of it. By that time, the Germans had withdrawn to the north end of the city. And then Jim Jefferson throws his mortar rounds down, uh, throws the 1100 mortar rounds on the, on the castle. So by that time, they were able to save some of the artifacts um, within Piazza San Tommaso itself. But uh, thankfully, they've all been restored to their greater glory. Um, the, this is our last question from the chat. Um, this is from Edwin Swift. What was the role of the first special service force, the FSSF, in the battle for Ortona? Um, the FSSF was a regiment that consisted of Americans and Canadians. Yeah, unfortunately, they were not involved in this battle at all. First Special Service Force is actually out on the west side of Italy because they're, uh, yeah, you certainly, and, and Mr. Swift is right, they're made of American Canadians, but they're, uh, they're on the west side of, uh, of, uh, of Italy fighting this battle. So unfortunately, they had no role uh, in this particular battle at all. This was, this was uh, 2nd Canadian Infantry Brigade. This was uh, the Loyal Ladies, the Seaforths, uh, the Patricias to a certain extent, um, and then the Three Rivers Regiment, the Engineers, Royal Canadian Engineers, and the 90th Anti-Tank Battery from New Brunswick. Charles, I'll say it again just for you, from New Brunswick, uh, involved in this fight. One question I have for you is that they, did they have bayonet where they, they were fighting um, uh, and in hand, you know, with the bayonet, like the First World War? So were they involved in that kind of battle in Ortona? Um, yeah, I'll to answer. Well, first of all, um, thank you for your service, both um, externally protecting the country in the military and internally as an RCMP officer. Um, second, I'm, uh, I believe I was you who, who uh, introduced David Hughes there a couple weeks back, if I remember correctly. Oh, no, it wasn't you. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, this was, this was war at its ugliest. Um, it was close, close quarter combat fighting. Um, the other challenge with urban operations fighting in particular is that the enemy could literally be on the other side of the wall. Um, he could be on the other side of that doorway. Um, um, and traditionally, again, fighting in the rural countryside, your enemy could be three, 400 meters away. You use your rifle, you know, he drops, blah, 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 and then you're, you're safe. Um, but you walk into a room and suddenly he's there. He's, he's, he is this close. Um, and now you are, you are punching and you are choking and you are bayoneting and you are or you're shooting him right there in front of you I mean this is the one of the challenges of urban operations and this is why in urban operations not only after the Battle of Ortona where first Canadian Patriot Division had a high amount of what is now called post-traumatic stress disorder um, uh, back then they called it combat fatigue or battle fatigue um, but this is one of the challenges of urban operations is that because the enemy is so close you walk into a room and he's there and now you are very violently killing him. It's not just looking through a rifle scope and killing him 300 meters away. He's literally right in front of you as you're killing him. And we're all built differently up here. Um, all of our brains are built differently. And you can have soldiers who, who won't do that. They can't kill somebody who's standing right in front of them, even if they've been trained to do so. Or they can kill one person that, and then they've had enough where they can kill three or 17 or 75 people like that. We're all built up here differently. And, but after a while, that does take a toll on your brain. And you're, after a while, you will have soldiers, your subordinates coming up to you, sir, ma'am, I'm done, I'm done. I've killed three people with my bare hands. I've killed three German soldiers with my bare hands, I'm done. I can't do it anymore. And so that's why within urban operations, you have a high amount of, of medical psychological casualties as well. Um, so yes, that fighting very much occurred in Ortona where Canadians, it was literally hand to hand combat. And in fact, um, on um, there was a there was an armored soldier from the Three Rivers Regiment who remembered that on Christmas Day, on Christmas Day he was actually able to get up into the church of Santa Maria de Constantinople and he was actually able to enjoy Christmas dinner with the Seaforths. And as he was walking back to his tank, 
he, he literally bumped into a German and had to knife him to death. Um, and, and that's how he remembers Christmas. And there was also German soldiers um, in, um, in David Halton's book about his father, Matthew Halton, who had reported from the battle. There was a German soldier who said that um, he, had saw, he had seen so many of his friends get killed on Christmas Day that, you know, he, uh, Christmas Day, he's, it's like he's dead on that day. And whenever Christmas Day was, came every year, it's like he was dead on that day because he would just remember that's the day I was fighting in Rotona and because he was involved in the close quarter combat as well. Uh, so yeah, so it was literally hand-to-hand -hand combat, knifing, strangling, choking, beating um, Germans to death, beating Canadian soldiers to death the exact same way. It was absolutely horrific, which is another thing that the Canadians weren't used to. Thank you very much. Uh, your expertise was really special. Uh, my wife, uncle, his name was Private Romeo Hebert. He died in San Leonardo on Christmas Day. And uh, my question was, do you have the same expertise in the battle there with the Gully and what happened in San Leonardo than you have with Ortona? I... I only know very superficially, I only know very little about, I know about as much as the regular Canadian does. I mean, uh, Mark Zulke in his book, Ortona, um, and he follows that two thirds, one third formula I was telling you about where uh, two thirds of the book is about the fighting in the Moro River and the gully. And then the last 102 pages of the book is about the fighting inside Ortona itself. So that I, I know as much as the average Canadian does about the Moro River and the gully. I do know that uh, first and third brigades were, were exhausted there. Um, and this is something that Major General Chris Vokes, who is the first Canadian Infantry Division commander, has taken much criticism from historians and military personnel because of how he handled the division at the Moro River and the Gully, that he was throwing one battalion after another in frontal attacks, nine, his nine battalions and frontal attacks, nine infantry battalions and frontal attack after frontal attack after frontal attack. And so he's very much criticized uh, for his handling of that battalion. But I do not have the level of detail about the Moore River and the Gully that I do about Ortona because my specialty within the Canadian Armed Forces is urban operations um, at the tactics school, so. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, I know David uh, gave us a lot of information about that. I really appreciate him very much on this. So thank you very much. I'll leave the chance to other people to ask questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think that we'll, uh, unless uh, there's anything pressing, I think we'll make that our last question of the, um, of the evening. And I will tell you though, Al, uh, that uh, we spoke this morning and, and uh, perhaps David, uh, Captain Hughes would be able to provide more detailed information uh, on that particular uh, battle of the gully uh, as we know we will be able to because uh, I know you've spoken to him about that. And um, thank you very much, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming tonight especially uh, Major Giroux for making the second presentation in our virtual speaker series and a very well attended event again too this, uh, this evening. I'd like to remind everyone uh, that December 10th at 7 p.m. Dr. Jane Jenkins will be speaking live via Zoom on the flu influenza epidemic of 1918. She's calling it Caroling in a Crisis. Christmas in New Brunswick during the 1918 influenza epidemic. And that will surely be very relevant to us these days in times of COVID, especially at Christmas. We hope to see you again next week. If you have any questions, you can always contact us at the Fredericton Region Museum by email at fredertonregionmuseum at gmail.com by phone at 455-6041. You can check us out on our website at www.fredertonregionmuseum.com or on our Facebook page for up-to-date information. See you next week. Looking forward to it, or not next week, sorry. See you on December 10th. And uh, thank you very much again for coming this evening.